Can you see my slides? Yep, they look good. They sure do. Uh, it's not it's not full screen. Feel better there now? Yeah, that's great. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the Search and Matching in Macro and Finance Monetary Economics Conference. Um, it's organized by Randy and uh, Yuzu, along with the organizers of SAMP. We're really happy to be hosting uh, virtual. We hope this is the last fully virtual monetary conference, and next year we could all be in person. So without further ado, we'll put a link to the program, uh, which is today and tomorrow. We'll put it in the chat, and uh, you can see the speakers there. Uh, for attendees, uh, please use the chat feature if you have any questions. Uh, each talk is 30 minutes. Um, so panelists, you're free to ask uh, questions throughout the talk. Just unmute and ask your question. Uh, we ask that you, you know, try to keep it to clarification questions. Um, and it's up to the speaker to sort of moderate, you know, if, if, if you want to, you know, move the question to the break. Okay, without further ado, Randy's our first speaker. So take it away, Randy. Okay, this is work with Wei and you. As you can see, I think they're both out there. And that's about endogenous liquidity, as most of my work is, and capital reallocation. So I guess I first became aware of this with Antonello's job market paper. I don't even know what happened to that, but he was applying search theory to capital reallocation, you know, in addition to the standard areas of labor, marriage markets, finance, monetary economics. I thought that was pretty good. So we're going to follow up on that. We're not the first to suggest this. Obviously, there's several papers followed Antonella, work by Kerman and others. Uh, we're going to bring to bear liquidity, which we think is relevant. So in terms of big picture, there's two keys to efficiency. In terms of investment, you have to get the right capital accumulation over time. And at a given point in time, you want to get capital into the hands of those who could best use it. And a traditional macro focused on the first, but two has been in the spotlight, not necessarily using search, but people are very interested in, in the secondary markets for capital. I don't have too much motivation on the slides this year, but you know, capital reallocation is big. About a third of total uh, purchases of capital comes from the secondary capital market. And importantly, if you look at the last bullet point, this has been a point made several times in, in the history of thought here, but Lagos and Zhang is a recent example. There's feedback in any asset market from primary to secondary markets and vice versa. The ease at which you could sell stuff influence in the secondary market influences your demand and the supply in the primary market and vice versa. And we'll see how this plays out. So the first thing I'm gonna do in this project is look at the facts, we're gonna present new facts for capital reallocation. Then we want to develop a model as primary and secondary capital markets, uh, as opposed to some things some of us have done in the past, we're going to try to use standard specifications. So, you know, not, not specifications designed to make the model say tractable necessarily, but, but to make it uh, amenable to quantitative work. In particular, one thing we do is go beyond IID shocks, which is kind of interesting. And there's much more to be done on that. So the other thing we're going to do, which differentiates us from almost all previous work is make a distinction between two types of reallocation. Uh, you can buy the other firm, an acquisition or a takeover, we're gonna call that a full sale where you get all of the capital, or you could purchase some of the capital, which we call a partial sale. And, and given cost of returns to scale, the socially efficient thing to do is that a high productivity firm should get all the capital of their trading partner but they're not going to be able to necessarily in equilibrium because of liquidity. We also wanna go beyond looking at say comparative statics or steady states. We wanna study dynamics in the sense of real business cycle theory, not in the sense of endogenous dynamics, but uh, responses to shocks. We wanna show the model actually can match standard real business cycle statistics. In some sense, the textbook RBC model is a special case. But we're also going to show it matches the capital reallocation facts once we incorporate two shocks. We're going to argue you need two, two types of shocks, in particular credit shocks as well as technology shocks. And we're also going to talk about policy, time allowing. So, Randy, can I ask you a question quickly? Please. So, the, uh, I mean, the total takeover 
it seems like the only way you can buy the other firms intangible capital, you know, their reputation, stuff like that. Are you going to make distinctions between that or? No, not really. Not in this paper. Okay. So the takeover to you is you just want to buy the whole physical, all the machines, and but you end up buying more than that, right? Well, you buy the land and the factory and the machines and, you know, the fleet of trucks. But, you well, know. But that, I mean, buy, like, the, like the brand. Yeah, you, you, get, you could get the brand name too, but we're not going to talk much about that. This is going to be, that, that's, that's an interesting topic. We're not going to talk too much about it. So it's kind of in the spirit of traditional growth theory where the inputs are labor and capital. And, you know, we're going to think of capital the way, you know, Cass, Koopmans, Kittle and Prescott did. And future works should think about intangible capital. I think that's interesting. We, we haven't pushed that distinction. So we're going to focus on this other distinction between full and partial sales. But I, I agree that intangible capital is interesting. Here's some facts. So first off, motivating liquidity, 42% of takeovers are facilitated by cash or cash equivalent. So, so nearly half the time when one firm is uh, taking over the other firm, you know, they're paying with cash or they have assets like T-bills that can easily be converted into cash and they use that. There's also obviously some credit. So just quickly looking at some data, we have CompuStat data for, a, for quite a large sample. It gives information on full sales or acquisitions and then partial sales where, you're, where one firm is buying part of the capital, total capital expenditures. Uh, so this is based on some of Wei's earlier work. The two variables we're going to focus on are the R share and the P share. The former is reallocation over total capital expenditure, which, as I said, is I said a third, so say 30%. And the P share, which is the fraction of partial sales over reallocation. So full sales constitute two thirds and partial one third. In the paper, we have, um, in typical Yu Zhu fashion, some nice microeconometrics, but we can't present that here in the interest of time. We're going to focus on a few macro facts. So, so, so Rainey, just, just really quick, when, when people talk about acquiring, say, a company with cash, don't they usually mean like highly liquid treasury bills or something? I mean, I guess maybe that's what you mean with cash equivalent. Yeah, that's, that's what not, they mean. Uh, yeah. I'm going to talk about that in more detail pretty soon. It's important, it's very, very important for our way of thinking about the problem. Before I get there, let me just show you some facts. So, so here's, uh, you know, motivated by this cash or cash equivalent, we're thinking liquidity is quite relevant and we're gonna capture the cost of liquidity by the inflation rate. And I'll say more about that, but taking that as given for now, here, here's uh, the R share. So reallocation is a fraction of total capital expenditure versus inflation. If you decompose it into a trend and cyclical component, the trend component, so in the longer run, inflation is strongly negatively correlated with uh, uh, reallocation in terms of the R share. But in the short run, it's positively correlated. And then down here, we look at the P share, it's positively correlated in the raw data, stronger positive correlation in the uh, long run data. And decreasing in the short run data. So we have this interesting phenomenon here, inflation and the R share are negatively related in the long run and positively in the short run. And you can read the last one, positively in the long run and negatively in the short run. So this tells us we're gonna need a couple of shocks. Credit's important, I'm gonna skip over this quickly. It just shows that the R share is, is negatively and the P share positively related to, to debt, to borrowing. So here's our hypothesis. So this, in the long run, what's going to happen is there's going to be uh, when the cost of liquidity is lower, as captured by lower inflation rates. We've also used nominal interest rates, including T-bills and corporate bonds. It works about the same. There's going to be more acquisitions because firms will be more liquid. And within acquisitions, fewer partial sales because they won't be bumping into their liquidity constraint as much. So this is a money supply story. On the other hand, in the shorter run, we're going to think about credit shocks. What do credit shocks do? Well, they give more reallocation, which is a positive credit shock, and fewer partial sales, again, because you're hitting your liquidity constraint less often. So this is kind of a money demand story. When there's easier credit, you go lower money demand. And that's going to explain the short run relationship between inflation and uh, 
the reallocation variables. When, when, when credit becomes easier, it lowers the demand for money, which gives a temporary rise in the inflation rate. In fact, you know, in compared to static sense, it will be a, a rise in the nominal price level, but in the data, it's gonna show up as short run inflation. So this is the way we're going to capture in principle, the two kinds of relationships in the long run and the short run. Randy, do, do you consider renting in this paper? Yeah, we do, we do. Yeah. Because you should, yeah. they copies that data, they don't have rentals. So when we say about 30% of capital expenditures reallocation, that excludes lots of things like small firms, not publicly traded firms and rentals. So in fact, capital reallocation is bigger. The way we set it up, there's a very interesting connection between rentals and sales. So I don't have time to talk about it here. Uh, we do consider that in some detail in the paper. Collateralized loans are very much like um, renting. You know, when you rent a car, then you bring it back, that's kind of like a repo, isn't it? I don't have, I know you're interested, Cyril, in this, but I don't have time to talk about it in any detail. So no surprise, we're gonna use one of these alternating market scenarios like Lagos, right? And I we've talked about these things for many years in many contexts. It's kind of perfect for our purposes. The centralized market corresponds to what we call the primary capital market. And the decentralized market is the, the secondary capital market. And in the paper, there's a bunch of motivation and quotes and references about people arguing that the secondary capital market is clearly decentralized. It's not Walrasian. It looks like an over-the-counter market. You have to find a counterparty, the terms of trade are negotiated, and there could be other frictions like liquidity or information. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to, and oh, by the way, this is also a good framework for our purposes because, you know, one thing about this environment, it easily accommodates alternative specifications for search, like directed or random matching. Uh, you can use bargaining or price taking or price posting. So we're going to make some choices there, but we think the model fits quite well. So it, this is not really what, this is without loss in generality. Think of firms as owned by households that have idiosyncratic shocks. That's what's going to motivate reallocation, of course, the paper also has aggregate shocks that we're going to do real business cycle analysis. What happens is firms will buy capital in the centralized market, in the primary market, if you will, and then there's going to be some shocks of productivity suggesting gains from reallocating capital across firms, and that's going to happen in the secondary market. And there's some arrival rate of trading partners. It's like in standard growth theory, capital produced in one period becomes productive next period. It's used in the centralized market to produce output, just like growth theory. So if you shut down the idiosyncratic shocks, it's a standard growth model, uh, like say Hansen 85's real business cycle paper. Now, some details uh, related to, for example, Harold's question. The model has a variety of assets. So capital is of course an asset. Interestingly, I kind of prefer this these days to households trading in the decentralized market because you put capital in that model, you raise the question, why aren't firms and why aren't households using capital to pay for goods? Well, here that clearly doesn't work. You can't get very far by using capital to pay for capital. It can, of course, be used as collateral, as I mentioned but you need other payment instruments as well. So we're gonna label something money. We have a mind empirically, you know, a cash equivalence, which would include T-bills and checking accounts. And I'll come back to that in the very next bullet point. We're also gonna talk about interest rates on fictitious assets, which are illiquid. So here's, it took me a long time to sort this out, but the last couple of years, I understand it better. There's an interest rate, which can be defined by a thought experiment, ask agents, how much cash they'd need in the next centralized market to give up a dollar today. Well, that's kind of what Irving Fisher had in mind by the nominal interest rate. That, that, that is an illiquid asset to the extent that it's an asset at all because you can't trade these claims. It's just asking the question, what are people thinking in terms of interest rates uh, from the advantage of, of intertemporal substitution? Now, in reality, there's a spectrum of assets, right? There's cash, checking accounts, savings accounts, T-bills, corporate bonds, antique guitars, your, your human capital, your good looks. They all have different rates of return. 
and presumably different liquidity if they're all going to be used in equilibrium. So for the talk today, I'll, I'll specify this in the tradition of macro, this, this spectrum by two points, this fictitious interest rate, describing time preference and the rate of return on the liquid assets. In the appendix, we actually consider multiple assets with partial liquidity, that's important. So back in 1980, Wallace had this wonderful uh, discussion in his uh, overlapping generations model that I'll quote him I'll, almost verbatim. He says, uh, Inflation is a tax really only on currency, but it's important to understand the entire rate of return distribution in equilibrium on all assets is going to be influenced in equilibrium by the inflation rate. So when the inflation rate goes up, the rate of return on cash goes down. In general equilibrium, that's going to affect the prices and rates of returns on all assets. Not on Irving Fisher's interest rate because that is not a substitute for cash, but any asset that's partially liquid will be affected by the inflation rate as agents substitute in their portfolio out of cash and into partially liquid assets. So there's a lot more that can be said about this, but I don't have time today. Here's the model. Here's wealth for an agent. There's taxes on capital earnings or profits. There's profits. As in the growth model, you have your undepreciated capital, your real balances, you could have some debts and you have taxes. Interestingly, in this setup, constant returns of scale tell us that profit is linear in effective capital, your idiosyncratic productivity shock times your individual firm capital holdings. And you get that by maximizing in the centralized market, labor, so there's gonna be a labor demand and labor markets here are frictionless, and that's gonna generate your profits. Given that, the individual, call it a household who owns a firm or call it a firm, it doesn't really matter here, maximize utility of consumption minus this utility of work plus the continuation value, which is random because the shock epsilon hat is going to occur after the centralized trading closes. And in general, it's not IAD, so you must condition it on the current shock. And here's your well raised in budget constraint. Profit income is incorporated in omega, so it doesn't show up here. And then there's your labor income, demand for real balances and investment in new capital in the primary market. And this is like lemma one from any kind of lagless right setup. Consumption is independent of the state. Your portfolio in terms of new capital and real balances would be independent of the state, except for the fact that without IID shocks, there's going to be some conditional expectation here. So this is kind of interesting. If we make the shocks IID, we actually get degenerate distribution of portfolios, but in general, we do not. The state of the economy is the distribution of capital, liquidity, and productivity. And in the decentralized market, when two agents in different states meet, the one with the higher productivity is gonna get some amount of capital and make a payment and they're both constrained, you can't buy more capital than the seller has, and the seller can't ask for a larger payment than the buyer is able to make. So the buyer can pay out of their liquid assets. They can also get some credit, and it's like um, uh, the quantity of capital I buy after the depreciation can be used as collateral. Perhaps there's a key attacky more like uh, haircut parameter, so perhaps I can't use all my capital as collateral. Even if you could, even if chi equals one, there's still a need for liquidity because you know if all I can get from you in terms of capital is one minus delta Q, well, you could get that yourself without even producing, just holding the capital. Plus you can use it as a factor of production. So I have to pay more than my debt limit to get capital, hence there's a demand for liquidity. Here's the key result. You might think it's going to be a big mess, but this result, although maybe it's obvious, is very important. There's only two possibilities. Either a stock out where I buy all your capital and I pay some amount over and above my credit limit in, li in liquid assets. Or a cash out where I pay everything I can, my liquid assets plus my debt limit, and I get some fraction of your capital. So with constant returns, efficiency suggests I should get all your capital all the time, but in general, I don't because of liquidity. I'm gonna skip this. We do bargaining in the decentralized market. Um, that's not a big deal, although it works out 
quite nicely, partially because the uh, profits are linear in capital. So here's a state space for meetings. Uh, let's look at cases where normalizing at epsilon is greater than epsilon tilde. And you know, if the epsilons are down here, I'm gonna get all your capital. I wish I could get more, but it's all you got. Meetings up here, I'm gonna get as much as I can and cash out. And we have the formula for this line dividing the regions. A quick aside, equilibrium and efficiency are at odds here. When, for example, um, epsilon is really big, efficiency says that's really important. I should get all your capital, but I don't have the liquidity, so I can't. Here's the Euler equations. Here we'll do the IID case. I mean, they're Euler equations. You can look at them or not. Um, Let's not even bother. But there's standard Euler equations derived in the usual way. What's key is that in the second equation, it looks like the standard money demand function, the nominal interest rate in one period equals the rate of return on liquidity. And this integral here tell you how much your liquidity constraint is relaxed. And then after tax profits will increase by that amount. So these are dynamic equations and I'm not gonna dwell on the algebra. Equilibrium, we have paths for these centralized market variables solving the standard conditions in the centralized market, you know, demand for capital, money, consumption, and labor, market clearing conditions, and then paths of the decentralized market variables, so the reallocation variables, uh, which I skipped over in, in skipping over the bargaining solution, but it's kind of standard. Real balances, of course, are, are part of the equilibrium. Notice this looks like a standard macro model. By standard, I mean like Modigliani, 1944, you know, the original ISLM model with equations. You got an investment equation, demand for money, consumption function, labor demand, uh, a feasibility condition, and this quantity equation, which is the monitorist, monitorist spin. The difference here is that DM adds micro foundations, not in traditional macro. But otherwise, it's kind of a standard model. And I'm gonna skip over that slide, which shows you can reduce all these equations to two equations and two variables. L is some measure of liquidity, B is some measure of the returns to capital. And lo and behold, these equations are actually the ISNLM curve. Even Keynesians would recognize the ISL curve, IS curve as the Euler equation for capital. And this is demand for liquidity. So it's liquidity preference. I don't, I don't want to make a big deal out of that, but if you restrict attention to steady states, you know, you can shift these curves, like here's an increase in the inflation rate, and we have theorems on existence and uniqueness and comparative statics, but from the diagram, it's clear that higher uh, inflation rates are going to lead to people holding less liquidity, a higher return from capital because capital is going to be not allocated so well. So let me not give you the intuition, I wanna to get to the numbers, but it reduces to something that can be displayed in a nice little diagram. When the, nope. uh, the, the labels on the ISLM are different than in the undergraded book though, do you, do you wanna comment on this? I mean, it's, um, I don't know my ISLM that well, but isn't it Y on the vertical axis and the I on the vertical and Y on the horizontal? So, yeah. so, so, it's, so what's the, um, so you must have thought about the, I mean, the yeah. nature of the question is you must have thought about the counterparts here somehow. So L is Y and B is I for some reason. The natural way to draw the diagram to me would be with capital on this axis and liquidity in that axis, because these are the two endogenous state variables. These are the variables in your portfolio. It turns out the algebra makes it easier to solve for B and L, which is some notion of liquidity and some notion of profitability to get it into two equations and two unknowns. So, you know, I don't wanna to make too much of a big deal of this. We represented an LB space just because you can get the closed form for these two equations and two unknowns. I mean, the nominal interest rate is in there. It influences, well, this, these are the two equations for the Euler, two curves for the two Euler equations. So the nominal interest rate is in there. The real interest rate is in there. Well, let's not get bogged down on that. I don't mean to blow you off there, Harold, but you know, I don't wanna, talk too much about ISLM today. Let's talk more like real business cycle economists. So as I say, we nest hands and so many of the targets are standard. Now we can't match 
uh, perfectly in our calibration. So there's a tension out there. So we do two calibrations. They all look pretty good, but they're not, not quite right. Uh, if we want to match the P share, the correlation between it and output, we use one. The other one is slightly better at matching the R share and output. Uh, it doesn't matter too much for the outcomes, but you know we had this tension. We can't fit things perfectly in terms of calibration, so we do two versions. Both are close. But these parameters are all pretty much standard. Um, we think anything interesting, government spending, the tax rates are standard. Um, these pledgeability parameters, you know, we get them from matching certain, certain targets. It's all relatively standard. I want to show the results. Randy, you have five minutes. Good. Half an hour is a pretty short talk. So first off, some steady state results increase inflation. So, you know, it looks like this diagram, except that in the fuller model, there's a lot more general equilibrium effects at play. So you get things like as inflation goes up, output goes down, but wait, it's, it's non-monotonic. Um, these different colors correspond to different bargaining powers. So depending on the details, including bargaining power, which is interesting and can be disciplined by markup data, you know, you get quite different effects on output, investment, consumption, employment, et cetera. We also have welfare down here, productivity. And importantly, these, this row here corresponds to the reallocation variables. The R share goes down with inflation. The P share goes up with inflation. Um, total reallocation ends up going down with inflation. Think of these as long-run results because this is comparing steady states. So we're kind of halfway home. You know, we can match the reallocation variables in the longer run because inflation affects liquidity and that affects how much capital reallocation there is in general and how many full sales versus partial sales in particular. How about the business cycle? So more like short run. Well, so we're looking at standard deviations of the standard variables, output, consumption, et cetera, and the new variables, R share and P share, and we're looking at correlations with output. So the first thing to observe, in terms of these standard RBC variables, the model does fine. You might say it's no surprise because it nests Hansen as a special case, including Hansen's use of quasi-linear utility, by the way. It's somewhat of a surprise because maybe these new features we added would, would kind of mess up the standard RBC results. Turns out not. Second, take this model with only productivity shocks. It's way off in terms of reallocation. The R share is not nearly volatile enough. The P share is not volatile at all, where it's very volatile in the data. The correlations with output take the wrong sign. It's just a mess, right? We, the standard RBC model, generalized to include capital reallocation, cannot match the reallocation facts at all. So we add shocks to credit conditions. This is this Kiyotaki Moore parameter, uh, how much your collateral you can use to get credit, how much of your capital purchased, your new capital can be used as collateral. Well, then with both shocks in play, and there's standard deviations set to match some things that are not in this table, look, it actually works. The, so green, Yuzu thought of this last night, green is for go, red is for stop. With two shocks, the R share, oh, actually that's one we target. So that looks pretty good. But look, the P shares, volatility is good. Uh, inflation volatility is maybe a bit too big, but it's better than being zero. Over here, the correlation with output for the R share takes the right sign. The P share takes the right sign and the right magnitude. Inflation output. So this model with two shocks, which you know you got more freedom because you have another shock, but we add discipline because we have more targets. I would say mission accomplished. This is kind of summarizing what I said. We need both shocks to match the reallocation statistics. 
we could try just credit shocks and no productivity shocks, but then you're going to miss on all the standard RBC parameters, I mean, observations. And you know, there's this list, I wanted to get more of this on the slide, but there are these stylized facts in the reallocation literature, uh, pro-cyclical reallocation, counter-cyclical um, partial sale share, et cetera, and the model is able to match all of those. We also do persistent shocks, harder, but not too bad actually, because then you're gonna get a, dis a distribution of portfolios, including investment and output across firms, depending on their current productivity. So the usual Lagos right result doesn't go through. And why is that? Because current productivity is the predictor of future productivity. And you can do this in general for some ends. We use it, we, this is the way we do it. We say your current productivity has a persistent component. And that's gonna be like a Markov switching process and this IID component. So we still get quite a bit of tractability. First off, we still get history independence, even though we don't get degeneracy. So the distribution of K hat, Z hat is going to be a function only of the distribution of epsilon, not past trades. So that's very convenient. Well, we have, we still do work on this, but one finding, I mean, future papers should pursue this further. <clears throat> Two big findings. One is kind of, this is interesting. If you're currently higher productivity, if your persistent component is higher, you have more capital, no surprise. You also have more liquidity in the calibration, but that's not a, a, a theorem that depends on parameters. That's true in the calibration. Here's something super interesting. It's like Victor Rios's first publication. He took Kittle and Prescott and redid it with a, a life cycle environment. Clearly more realistic, but at the time it was virtually impossible to compute. Victor was the only one who could do it. What he finds is the aggregate shocks generate the same statistics for the aggregate variables in the life cycle model as in the Kittle and Prescott model, which was not obvious ex ante. We get that too. For this um, non IID shock process, the real business cycle table, it looks pretty much the same. Randy, you're out of time now, so maybe one, one more minute, like one slide. Up. One slide. Don't forget, it was an introductory spiel, so I get a few seconds here. So this is like Victor's, but of course Victor's model, which he didn't look at uh, other statistics. You also get, you know, a distribution of consumption, investment, labor supply in the cross section because people have different points in their life cycle. Here, we not only get the real business cycle aggregates, we get, you know, a distribution of capital. So a firm size distribution and a distribution of money holdings across firms and future work should play that up. To conclude, we, do, we try to do three things. We build this framework for studying secondary capital reallocation with surge bargaining and liquidity. We're able to, to try to capture both full and partial sales. The model's still pretty tractable for steady states. It's like shifting curves. And even with heterogeneity, and non-degenerate distributions, it's fairly tractable. I didn't have time, but there's novel policy implications. Like you want to deviate from the Friedman rule in general, you may want to, you almost certainly do want to subsidize investment. And we could match the data in our quantitative exercise, both in terms of the traditional RBC statistics and the facts on reallocation. However, to do so, it's critical to have both credit shocks and productivity shocks. The end. Great, thanks very much, Randy. So our next presenter is Cyril Monet. I'll answer questions in chat if anybody has any. So Randy, if you'll stop sharing your screen, yeah, then Cyril can share. Thank you. You can see it. Great, let me put it in full screen. So it's always, uh, so thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to present this paper. Uh, it's always hard to present after Randy. Uh, although, you know, I'm also presenting before Ricardo. So that's, I don't know which one is harder. Uh, anyway, so this is the economics of permission decentralized ledgers. 
joint work with Raphael Auer and Yun Sung Shin. So, uh, you know, disclaimer, usual disclaimer applies. So, you know, as you, you guys all know, I, I guess I don't have to uh, spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we know that, I mean, since Koshalakota 98, money is a memory. Um, and, you know, when Narayana came up with this paper, uh, you know, among, I guess, in central banks, people were saying, yeah, money is memory and said, so what? Um, so it was a nice theoretical paper, nice theoretical contribution, but, you know, with little practical relevance. Um, but, you know, there's been, since 98, a lot of uh, technology uh, progress in terms of computing and cryptography. And this ledger that Narayana had in mind uh, is coming closer to reality. And so here um, is, you know, one, one of the ledgers that we all know is the Bitcoin ledger. And this is a representation of how bi the Bitcoin ledger would work according to uh, Jonathan and Thor. Um, so here you would have, you know, the ledger is sort of like, or the blockchain is like a book on which transactions are written. And, um, you know, on this book here would be written, for instance, uh, whether and how much uh, agents are holding uh, Bitcoins. So, you know, the ownership of Bitcoins would be recorded. And so here, when you have A and B uh, that want to trade, you know, so usually we refer to this as Alice and Bob. So Alice meets Bob and they want to trade. And Bob uh, has, you know, wants to buy the good of Alice. Um, you know, Bob has to have a means of payment, which would be the Bitcoin. Now, Alice doesn't know if, you know, Bob has the Bitcoin that Bob claim he has. And so Alice is going to read on the blockchain whether... Uh, Bob has the Bitcoin he claims he has. Uh, once a Alice verifies uh, B's ownership, um, you know, they can trade and then they can write a new page. And on this new page of the blockchain is going to be written that Alice and Bob traded and how many Bitcoin they traded. So then when uh, Bob meets Carol, uh, you know, they are going to want to trade again and see, so Carol is going to be able to read, uh, you know, the past transactions of B, of Bob, and whether, again, uh, Bob has the Bitcoin that he claims he has, and so on and so forth. Okay, so here, you know, what is striking is the fact that uh, every agent, they can read past transactions, so they can read the history of transactions, and any agents can actually write on the blockchain new transactions, okay? So this is what we call public and permissionless ledger. It's public in the sense that everybody can read, so download the ledger on their computer and read uh, the ledger. And it's permissionless because everybody can write on the ledger. So everybody has the right to write on the ledger, okay? Uh, there's going to be in Bitcoin, there is a selection process, which is proof of work, you know, where if you want to write that a transaction took place, uh, then you have to solve a mathematical puzzle. Uh, but essentially, everybody can invest in order to be able to win uh, that contest and be able to write a new page on the blockchain. Now, the problem with public ledgers uh, is that first, it doesn't preserve anonymity, okay, in the sense that uh, by downloading the ledger on your computer, you are able to trace all the, all the trades that happen and all the trades related to one address. And, you know, for large transactions, uh, when you want to reach like finality or data immutability, uh, so for large transactions, this may take a lot of time. Okay, so this is a point that has that Thor and Jonathan have, have made and Raphael have made as well. Um, so, you know, given that it takes, you know, a, a lot of time to reach consensus, to reach data immutability, the industry has moved uh, towards private permissioned blockchain. So private permission blockchain is going to be a blockchain where not everybody can read and not everybody can write 
on the blockchain. So the way that it works is that um, you know there's going to be um, you know rights that are given to some agents that we call validators, and these validators will be in charge of reading and writing on the blockchain. So there is a return to centrality. But the return to centrality is good because it's going to be able to preserve anonymity. And it's also going to achieve faster consensus. Okay, And in particular, um, what validators say is true is going to be considered as true. So you, know, you don't have to go through this proof of work and so on. You just need to trust what the validators are saying. So this is how a permissioned a private permissioned ledger would work. So instead of Alice and Bob being able to read and write on the ledger, they would have to go through these validators here. So the validators would uh, confirm the legitimacy of Bob's uh, Bitcoin holding or you know, any other asset holding. And then uh, they would also confirm uh, the trade that Alice and Bob uh, conducted. And then they would write that uh, on the ledger. The benefit, again, is that when Bob meets Carol, Carol is not going to be able to see how Bob obtained, uh, you know, its wealth, its financial position. So that's, that's a benefit. Okay, so what do we do in this paper is that we examine the governance of permissioned ledgers, okay? So in particular, we're going to ask the question, but, you know, you have these validators, and you're going to have to trust these validators to do the right thing. So how can you actually trust these validators? Who will guard the guardians to use, you know, Juvenal and Horvich, um, you know, language? Um, so who will guard the validators? So, you know, nobody will guard them. You just need, you will just need to uh, give them the right incentives. Okay, so you need to, to give the right incentive to validators so that validators, when they read the ledger, they actually read correctly the ledger. And when they write on the ledger, they actually write what happened. Um, the problem is how do you entice these validators to uh, do the right job? Okay, so that's one question we will ask. The other question we will ask is, you know, should validators be users in the system? So do you want to use and there we're going to use you know, internal validation, where the validators are also users in the system, or external validation, in which case the validators are not going to be users of the system. Well, so think of, ask a question, please? Yeah. It seems to me what they're doing is they're trying to move Bitcoin closer to PayPal. Is that kind of an accurate way to think of it? So PayPal would be uh, a permissioned and private ledger while Bitcoin would be public and permissionless. So in that sense, yes. Sort of in between. Yeah, so something in between. Now I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, in this paper, we take it as given that, uh, you know, you want to operate a private and a permission ledger, but it could be that a public permissionless is better, okay? But I'm not going to, to take a stance on that at the moment. And then, so the last question is going to be, what is the best validation protocol you know, to update the ledger? So basically, how many validators do you want and what type of uh, decision protocol should be used in order to update this ledger? So can I, uh, can you clarify two things for me that, one, I think you're gonna go to that's like how many validators, because I'm thinking here like in one, I mean, a limit case is like if the Fed opened the reserve accounts to everyone, that's that's a case with one validator, right? It's just exactly. like still not, not necessarily they need to make public. And then the second question is regarding public. Uh, so in, in practice, the IDs are public, but it, it, it's not clear how public that is in terms of the economic content, the sense that you cannot verify which ID is mine you cannot ver like it. You there is some level of privacy that's that's that. I, I mean, it's not totally private, but I know like you you see this investigation from the FBI. They try to track who has which account or who is like criminal. Or that. It's super hard. They really no, no, yeah, yeah. so it's I, not something trivial to. Yeah, so I will have so you know you, 
you're absolutely right to think of uh, you know the, the the like central banking as being a limit case, and this is what we will find. There is a case where you want to have a measure zero validator or basically one validator doing all the job. And on your second point, um, what I think is is uh, going to be uh, you know you don't need to know uh, to which the address belong, um, but you know, knowing the address and knowing the flows into the address, they can can reveal some information. So let me, you know, leave it at that for the moment. But you could see that, um, you know, by exploring transactions between address, you can actually uh, elicit like the trading strategies of the owners of these address. So you know that that that. Uh, as far as that's as far as I can go with that. Uh, I mean, now having said that, there is there is a push towards this uh, private and permissioned ledger, and you know again here we take it as given. Um, okay, so what we're gonna what we do in the paper is um, we present. So the paper has three building blocks. Okay, the first one is a credit economy. So this is this is going to be very familiar to you guys. Um, and you know the, the credit economy um, we're going to see is going to need a record keeping device in order to operate. Okay, and so that's going to be the second building block. I mean, if you want to have credit in equilibrium. And so that that's going to help us introduce the second building block, which is going to be the ledger. Once you have the ledger, you know you could assume, like Narayana does, that the ledger always record perfectly um, what happened. But here we're going to actually endogenize the validation protocol. So you know, in Narayana's case, the ledger is common knowledge. Um, everybody knows. Everybody can read the ledger. Everybody knows the past transactions, the history of trades, and so you can easily. Um, implement trade or credit through exclusion, okay? Now here, we're gonna make the a minor change, which is that the ledger is not going to be common knowledge for all people in the economy, but only among validators. And we're gonna see how this changes things. So what we find is that uh, if you want to reach a stronger consensus, uh, you're gonna have to pay higher rewards to validators. Uh, the reason is that we're going to assume here that voting, so when validators, uh, they, they want to confirm a trade, they will vote, okay? And we're going to assume that voting is costly. And um, a, a trade is only going to be validated if a supermajority is going to be reached among the validators. So those guys, who, those validators who voted, and they voted according to the supermajority, they will get a reward. Uh, but because voting is costly, validators are never going to be sure that the supermajority is going to be reached. And so they might not want to cast a vote in the first place. In other words, the validators here are going to play a public, a public good contribution game with noise, which implies that uh, if you want to have a high supermajority, so which here means a strong consensus, you're going to have to pay validators uh, hefty rewards so as to induce them to actually vote to cast the vote. So that's the first the first result. So stronger consensus, which means high supermajority, uh, implies high rewards for validators. The second result is that uh, you know a dy dynamic incentives are going to be crucial for governance. Okay, so you know that sh should not surprise you guys. Um, so when you can rely strongly on dynamic incentives, you're going to have few validators. But, and this is contrary to what you would expect, these validators will have high rewards. Okay, And this is linked to this strong consensus above. And I, I will try to explain that. Um, okay, Because usually what happens is that uh, when you have strong dynamic incentives, you don't have to pay a lot of rewards, okay? Because the future value of rewards, of future rewards is gonna be very high because dynamic incentives are strong. Uh, you know, people are very patient. So they value future rewards highly. And so you can reduce 
the, re the, the payment that you make each period. Here, it's not going to be the case. So with weak dynamic incentives, you're gonna have that many validators is gonna be optimal and these guys should have low rewards, okay? And the other thing is that we find, but I'm not going to spend time on that, is that internal validation is going to dominate uh, external validation weekly. So this means that validators should also be users in the system because that, in, that induces them to actually have the system work. Okay, so here is the first block. Uh, so this is your typical credit economy. Uh, so time is, you know, discrete continues forever and agents discount at rate beta. Um, there's going to be two production stages in each period and one non-storable good per production stage. So we're going to have an infinitely lived, a continuum of infinitely lived agents. Some of them will produce in the first production stage and some of them will produce in the second production stage. So there's going to be a measure one of agents who produce early on, and there's going to be a measure one who produce later on. Um, actually, one minus F that produce later on and F that are faulty. It's, I mean, for this talk, just set F to zero. Okay, so um, shouldn't bother with that. Now, how do these guys uh, trade? Well, they first have to meet, and so there's going to be a probability alpha that an early producer meets a late or a faulty producer. Okay, so here is your credit economy. So for two production stage in each period, so the first production stage followed by the second one, you have Alice and Bob. Alice has a linear disutility of production. Bob has, a, you know, usual concave increasing utility out of uh, consuming Alice's good. And in second production stage, B has a linear cost of producing its good, and Alice has a linear utility of consuming the good. We could make that concave, you know, the preference uh, of Alice concave, but this would complicate things a little bit. So how do these guys agree on X and Y? Um, well, they are going to play a coordination game. So when they meet, Alice and Bob, they announce a pair X, Y, and if they, if the pair agrees, then they are going to implement it. Okay, so in this setup, you have that the first best is x star given by u prime is of x star is one. And we know that absent commitment, the only equilibrium is autarky. Okay, so for these trades to, for trades to go through, you need a record keeping device. Okay, so we are in a monetary crowd. So usually what you have is that Alice might have a coin or, you know, a token and uh, Alice, uh, sorry, Bob as a token. And then Bob uh, tells Alice, okay, give me X and I give you my token. Um, Alice agrees. And then uh, Alice has the token in the second production stage and then redeems it with B and, uh, you know, B as a token. So that's great. Now, when we say that, or when I describe this story, uh, the token was physical, okay, B, Bob actually had a physical token in hand that Bob could transfer to Alice. Now we live in a world that is increasingly uh, dematerialized. And so the tokens are also dematerialized, okay? And so that's what you should have in mind here is that Alice and Bob, they don't meet physically, okay? So you cannot, Bob cannot hand a, to a physical token to Alice. It all happens, you know, digitally. Um, and the problem is, you know, how do these guys update then the ledger? Okay. So here is the ledger. So that's, you know, that's why we need a ledger here. And we introduce the idea of a ledger because it's a, a digital credit economy. So the ledger is going to record the results of the coordination game. Uh, and of course, you know, here you can summarize all the history by labels. So, um, good and bad labels. So if you have a bad label, it means that, uh, you know, you sort of defaulted on your loan. So again, here, when I say loan, it means that B consumed, when B consumes early on, it's the same as if A was giving a loan to B, uh, expecting that B would repay Y in the second production stage, okay? Now, when B doesn't pay, uh, this should be recorded as a bad label, okay? And a bad label here is gonna be an absorbing state in the sense that if 
sometime in the past you've defaulted, then you know you have a bad label and you should keep your bad label. So the ledger here. So Cyril, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Feel free to defer if it's. I mean, suddenly it, this switched into having record keeping for reputations, and, but all the initial stuff of Bitcoin is just record keeping for ownership. I mean, yeah, do, we, so, do we have to think yeah. the same or? Yeah. No, no, that's great. So this is like this comes to this point. So let me defer by just thirty seconds. Um, so yeah, so here you know the history is summarized by label, and the ledger is private. Okay, so the early producer cannot tell, cannot read the label. Okay, of its of its counterparty. Now, as you know, Ricardo mentioned, uh, how do we how do we match that with money? Okay, so here think of having a good label as having a legitimate token. Okay, so let me go here. Um, yeah, here actually. Okay, so here what's going to happen is that Alice and Bob they meet, and Alice is going to ask the validators. Well, Alice is going to say that to the validator, okay, Bob is telling me that Bob has a Bitcoin. Okay, can you actually check that this this Bitcoin is legitimate? So the validators will go and read the history of trade and they will say, well, B is good. So the Bitcoin is legitimate, okay? You can trade. So then Alice trades with Bob. So here you should, there is a sort of a missing part here, which is that Bob is, uh, so the validators are seeing that trade and they are transferring the Bitcoin to Alice at this point, okay? Then at this point, the Bitcoin is with Alice uh, and here they can, you know, B knows that A has a Bitcoin. So then, they, you know, B produces Y for Alice and Y should transfer the Bitcoin. Um, the validators are going to say, well, did B actually produce? You know, they say yes and they vote yes. And then uh, they are going to retransfer the Bitcoin from Alice to Bob. Okay, so this is where you're right that it looks very close to uh, you know, a ledger that keeps tracks of uh, reputation. Uh, but this is what, at the end of the day, this is what the, the, I mean, this is very close to what Bitcoin is doing, although there is steps missing in there. So I hope that answers your question. Sorry, you had seven minutes. Yeah. Do you think it's fine to interpret this uh, as like, not a person, but like each of this is an account. It's like I have an account with one Bitcoin. I may have several accounts on Bitcoin. So get a bad label doesn't mean that I got a bad label. It just means that that account that I have that I claim I had a Bitcoin, yep. it's it's excluded and it's false. Exactly. It's a mistake. Yeah. So you could do that, right? You could you could open an account and say to to Alice, okay, I have you know on this account I have a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. so it's but, not but a, yeah there's no so way for Ali to trust you right yeah so it's just about that account it's not about the yeah, the, yeah. That happens. Uh, so you know because of time let me go fast on this one this is the global game thing so you know uh, I'm gonna go fast on the global game so that's the third block okay so th this was the ledger now I'm introducing the validation protocol um, so there's gonna be v validators who will be in charge of reading and updating the ledger. So making sure that your Bitcoin is legitimate if you want. Uh, so these validators are going to be selected from late producers. So this would be internal validation, or they could be selected from early producers or other agents who do not trade on the system. So this would be external validation. Okay, so we consider both in the paper. Here, just have in mind that we, we have that validators are selected from late producers. Validators are going to vote on labels and whether production took place. Uh, and, you know, but it's gonna be costly for them to uh, essentially verify. So you know, it costs uh, CV to verify and CS to, to cast a vote to send, to send your, you know, your label. Um, if you want to cast a bad vote, of course you don't vote, okay? Because it's costly to vote, and so you only vote if you think, you know, if if you want to signal that uh, the label is a good one. Anyway, uh, the label is adopted. So this this cost, sorry, are uh, idiosyncratic, okay? So uh, there's going to be a common component to this cost, but also an idiosyncratic component. 
Um, okay. So the label is adopted if you have a super majority of validators who agree on the same label. Okay, so tau here would be the fraction of validators who agree that the label is good and tau would be greater than one half, okay? Um, so, so Sarah, it seems to me that you snuck in some assumptions here. Like, for example, why, I mean, not casting a bad vote, that would depend on how the validators are compensated, right? Which you haven't told us. Yes, I will. So each validator are going to be rewarded with Z if uh, the label is good, okay? So if they agree that the label is good, they will get Z produced so, by the so label. that's how it works? I mean, it seems like more important to reward them for sort of finding bad. Yeah, um, but the thing is that, you know, if you're a bad validator, if you're, a, sorry, a bad producer, you have no incentive to reward them. So as a, as a validator, uh, you know that you're not going to be rewarded if you cast a bad vote. I mean, we can discuss that later uh, if you want, but I mean, we, we thought about that. Um, so here you, you only cast a vote, and that's a um, uh, result, it's not an assumption. Uh, the assumption is that it's costly to cast a vote or to verify, but it's an equilibrium to only vote if you think the label is good. Okay, so this, I went through that. Um, I mean, up to now, I haven't introduced any frictions really, um, but here reaching consensus among validators is gonna be difficult, okay? Why? Because validators, they cannot commit to validate. So you cannot force them to validate and producer can make, can make actually side payments to validators. Uh, so that's gonna be the two frictions that we consider here. So, you know, producers can bribe validators so that they write the wrong uh, label uh, on, the, on the ledger. Actually, right and wrong is a wrong terminology. Um, so producers can bribe validators so that validators write the good label on the ledger. Okay, so then, you know, that's the setup. And then we do mechanism design. So given, you know, first, given the design of the ledger, we ask what is the trading allocation that you can achieve? And then once you have that, so this allocation of course depends on the design of the ledger. And then we ask what is the best de design for the uh, validation protocol? Okay, so what should be the number of validators? What should be the super majority? How, you know, how much validator should be rewarded? and all this to maximize aggregate welfare. So the first result is the, renting, the, the rent result, okay? So validators here, they should earn enough rent in order to incentivize them to cast a vote. And, you know, because of this uncertainty regarding the cost of voting, validators are never sure that, uh, you know, if they are not paid a lot, they are never sure that those validators with a very high cost of, validate, of casting the vote, they will actually cast the vote. So they are never sure that um, you will reach a super majority that is required. And so that's why you need to pay validators a lot. Okay? And you need to pay validators um, more if you want to achieve a higher super majority. Okay? So if tau increases, you're gonna have to one, you're gonna have to increase the reward to validator by uh, quite a lot. Okay, so that's the global game gives us the payment or the reward uh, that validators get as a function of the supermajority rule. And this is increasing. And then yeah, comes the bribe. Sorry. Say again? Yeah, one minute. Okay, thanks. Uh, then comes the bribing. Okay, so here, what, what can happen is that, uh, you know, Bob got uh, Alice is good, so you know everything is fine. But then when it comes the time to produce, Bob is not producing. But Bob wants to keep its label. And so Bob might actually bribe these validators. Okay, so how, how large will the bribe be? Well, it's gonna depend on uh, what Bob had to produce for Alice, but also for, uh, it depends on the rewards that validators uh, were getting. So here is the maximum bribe that Bob would 
be agreed to, to spend. So, you know, this is uh, X here is the amount that Bob should produce to Alice. And this was the amount that the validators should uh, receive. So this is the, the, the amount that Bob would spend so as to have its label uh, being registered as good label, okay? Now, Bob, this is the money that Bob would spend, but Bob only has to convince a fraction tau of validators, okay? So Bob is going to say, okay, I'm going to take that amount divided among these tau V validators. And, you know, if this is high enough, the validators will say, okay, fine, I, I write the wrong label on the ledger. Okay, I write good, although Bob did not produce. So the validators are not going to accept such a bribe whenever uh, the expected loss of doing so is greater than the bribe they receive. So what is the expected loss of accepting the bribe? Well, with probability pi, they're going to get caught. I haven't told you that yet, um, but pi is the probability of getting caught for a validator. And this is essentially the lifetime discounted value of being a validator in this economy, okay? So lifetime discounted value of rewards. So whenever uh, this thing is greater than the bribe they would receive, validators are not going to accept a bribe. And this blue object here is gonna be related to the dynamic incentives. Okay, so how does it work? Well, the, the designer wants to, wants to maximize its objective function, which depends on the trade size minus the validation cost, the total validation cost. And so here you can see, of course, that the objective function is going to be decreasing in, in the number of validators. Okay, so the, the designer wants V to be as low as possible. Okay, but if V is very low, if you look at uh, the incentive constraints of validators, the bribe size per validator that you bribe is actually increasing. Okay, because of course, you know, these guys are going to receive an increasing amount if you don't have to bribe that many guys. So the bribe size increase, which means that the incentive constraint is going to bind. Now, how can you relax incentive constraints? Well, you know, you can increase the supermajority threshold. Okay, that, that would relax the, uh, the incentive constraints. The problem is that if you do that, um, the reward, because uh, consensus is very high, you need to pay the validators uh, higher reward, so Z increases. You know, so the the right and the yeah right hand side increases, but also the left hand side increases, and so here you have a trade off, and the trade off is resolved by these dynamic incentives. Okay, so when the dynamic incentives are very strong, it's actually it's actually going to be good to increase the tau, okay, because it's going to relax the incentive constraints of validators. When delta, these dynamic incentives are weak, well, increasing tau is not going to help so much. And so you, as a designer, you don't want to increase tau too much. And you know, the last bit is that you can, of course, also play on the trading allocation. So I hope you got the intuition and because of time, I'm gonna skip all that. Um, you know, I hope you got the trade-off uh, that plays in this economy. So uh, I presented a simple model to study the economics of permission ledger. Again, I'm not saying that a permission ledger is better than permissionless. Um, it's natural to think that many validators and high supermajority threshold are necessary for strong governance, but actually, I mean, it's true, but it's not going to be consistent with fundamental uncertainty in the sense that fundamental uncertainty might uh, not allow you to reach consensus most of the time. Um, and because of this fundamental uncertainty, you will need to pay large rewards for validators. Um, so a stronger consensus in that case comes at the cost of eroding the gains from trade. And at some point, trade will collapse uh, even in permissioned uh, ledger. So you won't be able to get any trade off the ground. Okay, let me stop here. Thanks a lot for your comments. So just one question, v equals, v equals one, is that a central bank then? And, and yes. why not have um, a central bank? I mean, what, what's the- Yeah, yeah, yeah. so v, v, is, v tends to zero means that you, you only use uh, measure zero validator, so one validator, because each agent has measure zero. 
And so is, that, is it? For, I mean, so is the cent is the central bank the optimal solution to the problem, or is or is it not? I mean, I guess it, 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 it is if you have that the incentive, uh, the dynamic incentives are strong enough. So if this thing is high enough, then the solution is going to be that V tends to zero. Yes, and so you have like a central bank, and you achieve the efficient allocation actually. But if you have weaker incentives, then you actually want to play on all margins. So you want to decrease, you want to increase the number of validators, you want to reduce uh, the supermajority threshold, and you also want to reduce the size of the trade. So you affect all the elements in this economy. So it's not always that you get the central bank um, result. Thanks. All right, thanks, Cyril. So we've missed our break. I think uh, we'll probably proceed with the next paper. Our next presenter is, I believe, Xingjing. Is that right? You're yeah. presenting. Okay, great. All right, Xingjing, take share your slides and uh, begin when you're ready. All right. Give me one, one minute to set up. To... Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, they look good. All right. Well, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our paper. Um, the title in the program is uh, an old paper that we worked on. And this is actually a new work that we uh, kind of build on based on the previous work. Um, the new title is tentatively money as a constraint on market power and the business cycle. Um, and so in this new work with Ricardo, uh, we want to exploit um, the effect of this new role of money that we found in the previous work uh, on business cycle uh, fluctuations. Um, so what we found in the previous work is that uh, monetary policy could affect the real economy uh, through constraining the market power of financial intermediaries. Um, now, in this paper, we want to exploit uh, the business cycle implication of this new role. And so what we do in this paper is to introduce this new role into an otherwise standard business cycle model that New Keynesian model also built their model on. Um, and then, um, so to focus on our new role, we're gonna abstract from the traditional uh, monetary transmission through real balances by focusing only on uh, the cashless limit where most transactions actually rely on um, like credit as a medium of exchange instead of uh, fiat money. So what we found uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, work is that the effect of monetary policy on business cycle fluctuations can be summarized by uh, a wedge between uh, the marginal product of labor and a marginal rate of substitution between consumption and labor. So in a standard real business cycle model where uh, the, the only input of production is labor, uh, if the product market is completely competitive and there's no friction in the credit market, then uh, the standard result is that the marginal product labor should be equal to the marginal rates of substitution between consumption and labor. Um, in a monopolist competitive model, uh, the New Keynesian uh, paper uh, work, work is built on, uh, this ratio will depend on the product market uh, markup. And here in our model, there's an, another uh, wedge, which depends on sort of the market power of financial intermediary. And the market power will affect the difference between the interbank return and the deposit return. And this is the channel through which uh, the market power uh, and the market policy will affect the real economy through our channel. Okay, so before I talk about in more detail this cycle implication, let me uh, explain uh, the, the economic environment. So, Without uh, like monetary frictions, uh, this is a standard um, model with monopolist competitive firms. So it's a discrete time model, infinite horizon. Uh, to introduce later payment frictions, we uh, introduce two stages in each period, uh, a stage one and stage two. So in each stage, some, uh, some goods are produced and then consumed. Um, at the first stage, there will be a variety of good one um, these goods are imperfect substitutes, which induces monopolist competition uh, later. 
And um, the households are exactly uh, are identical, so it's representative households. And those households can earn or own uh, the firms producing consumption goods and in financial intermediaries that we call bank. Um, the bank will intermediate uh, some alternative medium of exchange. And the household also supplies labor to firms producing consumption goods. So the, the, the preference of the households are standard. So the CRA utility function for consumption goods and the disutility uh, for uh, labor supply is also standard. Uh, on top of the uh, you know, type one consumption and labor supply, uh, the um, type two consumption good, the stage two consumption uh, is produced uh, using labor in a linear fashion so that you know, there's nothing interesting happening in the second stage. Uh, there's no gain from trade from producing uh, stage, uh, stage two goods. Uh, the role of the good is just sort of a real unit of account. And also it helps uh, implement uh, payment. Okay, so, and, and uh, these uh, type one consumption good is sort of a composite uh, or, or, you know, the type, uh, of a variety, from the variety of those consumption goods produced at date one. The elasticity of substitution between those consumption goods are epsilon. Um, then, um, yeah. so then the production uh, in uh, those consumption goods follows a standard Cobb Douglas production function where the labor share uh, parameters are alpha. Now, so, so far it's standard. Um, then what we do is we're gonna introduce uh, payment friction. So we say uh, there are two types of media of exchange, potentially fiat money uh, and uh, an intra-period bond. So the bond is issued at stage one to implement payment at stage one, then it will be repaid within a period at stage two. A bond is just a claim over one unit of stage two good. Then at stage one, uh, there will be uh, three competitive markets. Um, the labor market, where the, uh, the, the household supplies labor and the firm hires labor, and uh, the competitive goods market, and uh, a bond market. So for a household, there's no friction uh, whatsoever. Uh, they have access to competitive labor market, goods market, and the bond market. The household doesn't face any friction even in the bond market, unlike uh, you know, standard monetary model where the household may face borrowing constraint um, and uh, may, may face, yeah. So here the household doesn't face any borrowing constraint and doesn't uh, face any friction, uh, even in a credit market. The friction is on the firm side. So the firm uh, can have access to the competitive labor market, competitive goods market, but they don't have direct access to the bond market. To have access, um, they have to go through uh, banks. Okay, so uh, on top of that, in our previous work, there's an additional friction, which is that uh, the firm may not recognize uh, this alternative medium of exchange uh, bond. Um, there's a fraction of firms may not, that may not recognize uh, bond as a means of payment. So for those firms, they only accept money, uh, say one minus gamma. Um, and, and so, we would imagine in modern economy, uh, the fraction of firms that only accept cash is small. And uh, that's why we'll be looking at sort of the cashless limit where uh, most firms in this, in this work, uh, where most firms will uh, recognize bond as means of, means of payment. So gamma goes to uh, close to one. Um, then uh, the only friction really at the limit is that when, a bank, when, when, a, when those firms uh, accept uh, the bond payment, they have to go through uh, banks. They have to deposit those payments to the bank and the bank charges a fee. How much the fee that bank charges uh, will depend on the bank's market power. So the, the market power will be here characterized by the bargaining power of the bank when a bank negotiates the terms of trade uh, with, the, with the firm, when the firm deposits money. Now, but then there's a question, which is in a standard RBC model in the, with representative agents, even though there's bond, bond is not traded, right? It's an illiquid bond. There's no, in, in, in equilibrium, the bond is in, in zero net supply, no one saves, no one borrows. And then those frictions about, you know, deposit rate, uh, the bank charges wouldn't matter. But the question is why it matters here in our model. And that's because, uh, exactly because there's payment friction, that payment flows are asynchronous for the, for the firm. So uh, we assume that, 
uh, the wage payment the per firm pays uh, the worker uh, is only paid later at stage two. It's settled later, uh, after in a way after the firm receives revenue from sales. Uh, it's the sales and wage payment is, doesn't happen at the same time. Um, uh, and then after the so then for workers who need to buy consumption good at stage one, they haven't received the wage payment yet. So the only so then uh, they have so then they, the way for them to buy consumption good is to either to hold some money before uh, be, uh, in, in the period from the period before or issue bond or sell bond uh, to to buy consumption good. That's why the firm, uh, you know, the, there's borrowing from the from the worker, and then when the firm receives the revenue, they need to wait until stage two to pay uh, the worker. So that's why the fir the firm needs to deposit those sales revenue. Then uh, you know there will be uh, actually uh, gross trading of those bonds. Um, okay, so that's so that's the that, that's the summary of our model environment. The only thing we add is the market power of the bank and the asynchronous payment so that there's deposit from the firm and borrowing from the worker. And the only friction is on the deposit, deposit, uh, deposit side, okay? Now, to analyze equilibrium, we're gonna first look so, at the so, household so optimization. To, so, yeah. so, sorry, just a silly question. So, so is that an, a restriction that you impose that the payment flows are asynchronous? I mean, why couldn't they make them yeah. synchronous, pay the workers right away when the from receives the uh, money for the goods. It's a restriction that, so to make the payment friction relevant, in reality, we'd imagine not, pay, not all payments happen simultaneously. So, you know, to model it, we, we can, uh, here's just a modeling choice that we assume wage payment is paid later and the firm deposit money. Alternatively, you could, we could assume that uh, worker received the wage payment earlier, but the firm um, receives the revenue from sales later. That there has to be some asynchronous, uh, you know, asynchronity. But no, that's which, fine. I, I guess in a in a yeah. rebusiness cycle context, though, if you assume that uh, that there was a production sector of firms that someone was paying workers only with a period delay, there would also be implicit bonds in that that moment, right? I mean, the moment you make that assumption. So I was just wondering whether whether this delay, yeah. whether the distinction here. I mean, you're emphasizing the distinction to the RBC, but it seems well, well, Harold, the distinction comes say, from the main, from that, from that asynchronous restriction, or does it come from the top, from something about the timing here? Harold, I guess that's what I was trying. Commenting on your comment, I think the best way to think about the standard RBC model is Arrow de Bru. There's a lifetime budget restriction, so the issue of when you receive your income mm -hmm. and when you make your expenditures really doesn't come up. Right. If there's no friction, actually, it doesn't matter whether, as you, you know, it, so asynchronous payment is important only if there is, uh, you know, incomplete market or friction in the, in the market. Well, Arrow uh, Debrew has Arrow Securities, so therefore, you know, possibly right, you trading of securities. You can in that way, but the as mm -hmm. asynchronicity of expenditures and receipts does not cause a problem for the Arrow Security implementation, right? No, no, I'm, I just, you know, just, I just wondered about this, is bond yeah. traded, but I think I understand. Can I make a quick comment? That, so for example, cash in advance, you can think of it as an example of asynchronous. You cannot spend your current income, you, you can only spend stuff you in advance. You can think of this as cash in advance, but you don't rely on cash at all. You can just borrow without limit. So it's, it's familiar from that. Yeah. Okay, so this is good um, because that's the key friction. Now, uh, now uh, let's look at uh, the equilibrium of the model. So to, to understand the equilibrium, we're gonna first look at the household optimization. It looks pretty standard. The household will just choose their consumption, labor supply, uh, money demand, uh, bond demand, and uh, money demand uh, for the sec uh, next period to maximize their lifetime utility. But now because there is payment friction in each period, the household faces two budget constraints, one in stage one, the other in stage two. In stage one, when a household needs to buy consumption good at stage one, they need either to pay for the consumption good using money or using the bond they issue. So the budget constraint is that if they carry some money from the previous period, phi t here, I denominated everything uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, like all the prices are denominated in day two consumption good as a numeraire. So phi t is the price, uh, real price of the money in, in terms of the day two consumption good. Uh, but that's just a unit account. 
And so then uh, given the, the money balance, the household can either uh, issue more bond or, or you know, purchase bond, or, uh, and then, or, or they can purchase some consumption good. The price of consumption good I is PIT. Um, then, um, so I'd say, so here in the first, uh, in the budget constraint, you can see that, um, you know, there is a relative price between uh, money and the bond. The relative price is uh, one over RT. RT being uh, sort of the uh, interbank interest rate, a real interest rate of the intra-period bond. So one over RT is the relative price of purchasing the asset, of purchasing the, 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 the consumption good using uh, money uh, or using bond. And then at stage two, uh, the budget constraint is, uh, is that the, the household will uh, on the revenue side receive some profits from those firms, some profit from the bank, if the bank has market power, they earn some profit, uh, some revenue from producing day to consumption good. They receive the wage payments. They receive uh, some pay, uh, you know, payments from the bond if they purchase bond. They receive the resale value of the, the residual money if they haven't spent all the money. Then uh, all those revenue can be used to purchase day to consumption good or uh, start to hold um, money for the next period. So that's the uh, household uh, optimization problem. From this, we get three first order conditions. One is the uh, optimal choice of consumption uh, at, date, at stage one. That just says the marginal utility of consumption is going to be equal to the price of, the, uh, of, uh, uh, of those consumption goods times the shadow value of the budget constraint. Now, because there's a stage one budget constraint and uh, the household doesn't face any borrowing constraint in terms of issuing bonds, so uh, really this relative price between bond and money uh, is the shadow value of the budget, relaxing the budget constraint. And that's why one of our T shows up here. Then um, now, if you look at the first order condition of labor supply, uh, the wage income doesn't show up in a stage one budget constraint. It shows up in a stage two budget constraint. So um, this one of our T shadow value of uh, the stage one budget constraint doesn't show up in the first order condition for, uh, for labor. Then the first order condition for money pins down the, uh, the old equation for money, which says that uh, the relative uh, price of the money today versus tomorrow will depend on the policy, uh, kind of the uh, relative price of bond versus money, one of RT. So, uh, and, and we know when by, by controlling, say, for example, the money supply, we're going to affect the relative price of money today and tomorrow, then in that way affect the, this policy rate. R R T. So for the rest of the analysis, we'll take the R take R T as the policy rate and look at the the effect of changing policy rate on the other variables. Um, okay. So now let's go to the firm side. On the household side, it's more or less standard. So on the firm side, um, now this delay, like this asynchronous payment, will matter because the deposit rate will affect the firm's profit. When a fir after firms uh, uh, gets the revenue from sales, they need to make the deposit to earn a deposit rate, which may be different uh, from the this Fed funds or interbank rate RT, uh, and will be affected by market power. Then a, a worker pays the uh, so the firm pays worker. Now the deposit rate is pinned down uh, through Nash bargaining. Um, so the, the the where the market power is, so the bargaining power of the bank is theta. Uh, so if the interbank rate is RT, so the gain from trade from uh, a unit of deposit for, for, the, uh, for, for the bank is R minus RD, and the gain from trade for the, for the, for the firm is, R, is RD. Now, how does the monetary policy affect uh, the, the firm and how that depends on the friction in the market already shows up here. So uh, monetary policy affects the relative price between bond and money, one over RT, one, one plus RT. Then, uh, then uh, the, uh, the deposit rate is equal to one minus theta, the bargaining power of the depositor or the firm times, the, the, uh, times RT. So you can see that uh, kind of the difference between RT and our, uh, the deposit rate will depend on the market power of the depositor and also depends on the monetary policy rate, RT. And then in, uh, in, in, in this profit uh, equation, in terms of notation, uh, this price, uh, PIT, is just uh, the price of the 
uh, uh, type of, uh, sorry, good I. BT is the price level for uh, aggregate price level at stage one. Uh, WT is just the wage rate. All are in, uh, all those prices are denominated in, in goods too. And uh, it's a monopolist competitive environment. And then in this environment, the price, a PIT, uh, depends on the output of the firm, YIT. So the firm basically faces a locally downward sloping demand curve. And YT uh, is gen uh, produced using Cobb Douglas production function. So this firm's uh, optimization problem will give us uh, this uh, kind of uh, standard op optim uh, first order condition uh, in terms of labor demand. The only thing new is that uh, the revenue of the sales will be multiplied by uh, the gross deposit rate. Now, we think this is important because you know, it shows that uh, like firms cash management uh, would matter. And uh, actually how long the firm deposit the money uh, what's the deposit uh, duration also matters because the return here is not just the interest rate, but also time, uh, depends on how, how long the firm deposits. So the efficiency of the firm's cash management uh, would matter also uh, in, in a richer setup. So just to so, connect it to yeah. uh, cash management problems of firms that I'm thinking about, I mean, you know, financial managers of firms typically are very capable of accessing bond markets and, you know, uh, trading yeah. all kinds of securities. Households typically have the problem that they may face a deposit rate that's below the return that could be earned in capital. Yeah, I, uh, but here it's now the other way around, right? Is, is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, the households here, you know, face the capital market, you know, the, the financial market interest rate, whereas, whereas firms are a little... Uh, you know, clumsy. Yeah, I, they've just, I agree. They've, yeah. So, I, I so agree, yes. I mean, so, uh, it, I, I could ask about the why and the how, but uh, that's that's okay. Um, it's a modeling choice that we we let a firm deposit. Uh, you know, if we say reverse the payment order, uh, it could be the the worker who is depositing the firm's borrowing. Say, if the firm pays the wage first before they they receive the revenue, the firm will be borrowing. So, in that sense. Um, yeah, it can be. So in reality, as you said, sometimes it's a firm who is depositing, sometimes it's a worker. Uh, in a model, uh, it's just a modeling choice. I think here's the you know the cash management uh, problem that shows up in a model could represent both. It's just uh, the way we model it here, it looks like it's a firm. Yeah, but I, I agree. In reality, probably uh, the friction is more severe on the household side. Uh, now, I, I forgot to say one thing is that uh, on the right, so the, the left-hand side of the optimization is the marginal revenue, sorry, marginal uh, return from hiring the, the labor. The right-hand side is the marginal cost of hiring the labor times the markup, the product market markup because of the monopolist competition. Now let's, so the, the equilibrium uh, can be given the policy rate, RT, the equilibrium consumption, labor supply, wage rate, and price level can be sum summarized by these equations. Um, now, the key is the uh, sort of we can, uh, it, yeah, let me analyze the equilibrium conditions. So the, so the, the, the equilibrium conditions include the labor demand uh, from the firm side, uh, the labor supply from the worker side, labor demand, uh, so consumption demand of the, uh, of the consumer, and uh, how the consumption is produced from labor. Then um, what's the inefficiency uh, in this economy? How does it show up in, in, this, uh, in, this, in the equilibrium? Let's look at it. So on, uh, by looking at say the labor demand and labor supply and consumption demand. So from the firm side, we get this equation that summarizes the labor demand from the workers, which says, uh, so the marginal return from hiring the worker is equal to marginal cost of hiring times the product market markup. Then on the household side, there's consumption demand, and uh, labor, su uh, labor supply. Now, the key is that on the consumption, in the consumption demand, because the consumption is a date one consumption of stage one, uh, the shadow value of relaxing the stage one budget constraint, one plus RT shows up there. Now, if we combine these conditions, we get uh, the this, uh, this, uh, this equation, if we plug the prices P and W into the labor demand equation, which says, that the marginal cost of producing a consumption good, which is the, uh, the this utility of uh, uh, hiring a work, uh, like a working, uh, divided by the marginal product, uh, marginal product of the worker uh, F prime. And that's uh, from, the, according to this equation is equal to marginal utility of consumption divided by 
two sort of uh, market, uh, wedges or markups. One is the product market uh, markup. The other is the difference basically between the interbank rate and the deposit rate or the ratio between the interbank rate and the, uh, the gross deposit rate. Okay, so then now what's the marginal utility of, uh, of consumption, which is, uh, is U prime. So we can see that, you know, because of the product market uh, markup, and the deposit market um, market power, um, there's a wedge between the marginal cost of uh, produce, producing the consumption goods and the marginal utility of consumption. Okay, so that summarizes uh, the inefficiency. So you can see that this, this wedge on the denominator summarizes the inefficiency. And um, yeah, so in the end, uh, the equilibrium can be summarized by one equation solving the labor supply, which is the equation I just showed you, and the inefficiency of labor supply relative to a frictionless benchmark uh, will depend on the product market market power and you know the difference between the deposit, uh, the interbank rate RT and the deposit rate RD. Okay, now let's look at. Let me look, use my maybe my last uh, five six minutes to to look at the business cycle frequency implication. This equation summarizes the inef potential inefficiency and the market policy will affect the, uh, the uh, business cycle through this component, as I said. Now, this component depends on actually three factors. One is the market power financial intermediary that we call ST here. Uh, before we just, that's just theta T, the market bargaining power financial intermediary. And then it depends on policy rate, IT. Policy rate is returned per, like a, per year, but our model period doesn't have to be a year. So then uh, the actual difference also depend on the modeling uh, period or to say the deposit duration. Now, uh, the so we want to first look at like the, the, how important is the deposit duration? Because as Harold said, you know, uh, uh, this uh, difference in the payment, uh, payment timing is important. Um, here, you know, if the difference in the uh, payment uh, timing is one quarter. Uh, if we use the new standard New Keynesian textbook uh, parameterization, um, and assuming the steady, you know, the 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 the, the bank market power is zero point eight, uh, if the payment duration, the deposit duration is just one quarter, then uh, a twenty five basis point initial uh, increase in the nominal rate will just create uh, something like negative two basis point drop in the output. So not much relative to New Keynesian model, which predict 15 basis point drop in the output. Even if the deposit duration is one year, which is uh, longer, uh, the drop is three basis point. Uh, so, um, you know, if by looking at that, it looks like uh, our channel uh, quantitatively is not as large as New Keynesian sticky price channel. Um, now, uh, so this motivates us to look at a potential uh, second impact of market policy, which is so far, we take the deposit spread, the market power financial intermediary, as, an, as a parameter that doesn't depend on monetary policy. But in principle, the spread could also itself depend on monetary policy. If it does, then the effect of our channel could be bigger. So what we do is we, we want now we, we empirically investigate whether this market power uh, measure, the deposit spread, respond to monetary policy. And by doing that, so we, what we do is we do a local projection method uh, estimate um, we compute the aggregate deposit spread, um, and then we run the local projection uh, regression, regressing age period uh, ahead uh, deposit spread change on, uh, say, uh, changes in policy rate on a, uh, at a monthly frequency. And what we found is that this, the deposit spread does respond to monetary policy. Uh, on impact, it's uh, one, one percentage increase in policy rate leads to a one percentage increase in this uh, spread measure of the market power of the bank. But this effect actually uh, it is quite long lasting. It's quite persistent. A one percentage increase in policy rate could lead to a one percentage increase um, you know, in, in the market power uh, 30, uh, 30 months ahead. And the peak response is a three, three percentage increase in response to one percentage increase in policy rate. Now, what we could do next is to uh, sort of take this empirical estimate as given, uh, think of uh, like a market power does respond to uh, a policy rate in, in this way, 
and uh, we're going to look at the impulse response again uh, of the, the, the model economy to policy rate shock. Now, to, to contrast our uh, the results, uh, uh, so we, we look at the baseline where the, we take the policy rate, uh, sorry, we take the market power as just a parameter, and we look at uh, this red line where the policy rate respond, uh, sorry, the market power respond to policy rate. Here we look at a uh, different from the baseline exercise, look at just a one time uh, shock to uh, nominal rate. Uh, so then we can see because it's just a one quarter. So here, by the way, one period is one quarter. Um, so because it's just one quarter increase in policy rate, the effect on the output is very small. It's just one basis point drop uh, on the in the baseline. And also uh, when we introduce persistence on impact, it's also not, not that the impact is not, not bigger. But the difference is that the, the result will be, the impact will be more persistent, right? long lasting. Um, now this persistence may not look that much, but it, 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 it can uh, kind of accumulate. Now, if we then uh, introduce our, uh, this new, new uh, channel through, uh, to this actual uh, uh, like uh, impulse response and you can then also uh, run like a persistent nominal rate uh, shock, uh, on impact is 20 basis point, 25 basis point increase in nominal rate, then it decays at 50% uh, uh, quarter by quarter. Now, uh, without this new, new uh, channel, the policy contingent spread, then the, uh, a, the, the, the impact, so the response of the output gap will die out at the same persistence at a, uh, as the nominal rate. With this new, new channel, remember the, uh, the market power respond in a more persistent way to nominal rate. Um, so because of that, this, uh, this impact, uh, this, the response in the output, output gap is much more persistent. So the difference here uh, is more persistent and these difference will, will add up, uh, which implies that you know, the long run uh, you know, impact, um, the long run response of the output to our, through our channel could be closer to New Keynesian response. So here we're just uh, borrowing the result from uh, Gali's textbook. Uh, say a 25 basis point increase in policy rate was the response in his textbook. So the, the response on impact of New Keynesian textbook is 16, 17 basis point. Then it dies away at the same rate as, as the policy, uh, policy shocks. Now our channel on impact is much, a lot smaller, but it, it's more persistent. So if we add up uh, those cumulative respond, uh, response in the, out, in the output uh, after 16 quarters, uh, the new Keynesian channel, uh, channel would impl imply uh, like a, the response of a 20 to a 25 basis point increase in policy rate will be 34 basis point. Uh, through our channel, it's 21 basis point. So it's a lot closer and it's quantitatively, it's, it's, it's comparable. Okay, so that's what we find so far. And it's, pro uh, this is our working progress because we want to understand why does the monetary policy respond to, uh, sorry, why, why market power respond to monetary policy? Could it be because what Randy mentioned in this uh, presentation that there's credit shocks and, or basically how credit frictions respond to monetary policy? So we, to understand that we need a theory and a theory needs to generate persistent response in market power to, to monetary policy to get the quantitatively large effect of our channel uh, on the uh, output gap. And that's something we still work on. Just to summarize, what we do in this paper is to show uh, uh, that media exchange consideration may be still relevant, uh, maybe quantitatively relevant for monetary, uh, monetary policy transmission at the uh, business cycle frequency, even at the cashless limit. Um, the magnitude of the transmission will depend on bank market power and how it responds to policy rate. Uh, it also dep obviously depends on policy rate. When the policy rate is high, actually our channel our result will be more significant. And it depends on the deposit duration. So what it's work in progress. And our next step is to uh, figure out a theory to explain the response of market power to, uh, to policy rate. Okay, thank you, Sunshin. And our next speaker is Peter Norman. Just use it, this is very quick. So you guys borrow some things from the Keynesian literature, like the monopolistic competition, but sticky yeah. pipe prices Play no role at all, right? No, no, we don't have sticky price. Yeah. So, but there's this claim you hear everywhere that you, there's no way to explain the data. Larry Chris Jenna says it. He hates sticky prices. He's embarrassed to put them in the model. 
but he says that he can't explain any of the data otherwise. This sounds like um, showing he's wrong. Yeah, we hope uh, to show there may be other channels that are quantitatively important. Right. That's our goal. Yeah. So, Randy, to, to, me, to be fair, I mean, they have a, a list of things they want to match, which we're not looking at here. So like the impulse response on inflation, for example, ours goes the opposite way than the one you would see in their textbook. So they would not, you know what I'm saying, they would not like this, uh, you know, this as a, a model that displaces them, theirs or anything. The way we see it is, you know, they focus on this exclusive sticky price model. Uh, and I think what we're trying to understand is whether, you know, these other media of exchange with market power effects, you know, uh, whether they are negligible, they can you know just ignore them, or you should bring them in into a bigger model. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see. So all we're saying is you you cannot brush that off because real balances are small, because these other channels seem to be there. Good. So any anyone else is going to discuss the previous paper, or should I go? Okay. Okay, thanks a lot for having me. So this is joint work with Janet, uh, Daniela, Bruno, and Randy, and they're all here in the audience, either as panelists or, so if you have questions having to do with the experiments, you may sort of wanna use the chat and ask people who know a little bit more than me. So the motivation here goes back to uh, just trying to sort of figure out the role of this is the essentiality of money in an experimental setting. So, I mean, I, I don't think I need to argue with you guys about uh, why we like uh, money to be essential. And uh, in terms of what makes money essential, so there are three features that are gonna uh, sort of be a part of our experimental setup, but is also part of any model with uh, where money is essential that I'm aware of. So we need some spatial friction, typically sort of lack of double coincidence of want. We need some limited commitment so that we can't just promise stuff and keep our promises. And we also need something having to do with imperfect record keeping or monitoring. Now, in terms of taking it to the lab, one issue uh, is that the standard monetary models, they all have infinite horizons, but when we take a finite truncation of these models, so take uh, Kiyotaki Wright or Schertz model or et cetera, then when we look at a finite truncation of the model, uh, we, we lose the monetary equilibrium because the way um, the way the, uh, the models are constructed is that uh, the backward induction arguments are, um, are just um, don't apply because there's no last period, but once there is the last period, the backward induction argument kicks in. Now, in terms of the experimental literature, uh, basically every monetary experiment that, we're, uh, that rely on some sort of micro foundation are using, uh, in one way or the other, such a finite truncation of a standard model. Now, it's kind of covered up a little bit and uh, in terms of the uh, termination rule is typically random, but uh, the random termination rule is in one way or the other combined with some sort of hard deadline. And the, the, the sort of argument for kind of trusting the results of these experiments as saying something about equilibria is that uh, one may want to sort of argue that because the probability that we run into the hard deadline is so small, maybe uh, experimental subjects approach these uh, experiments as if it would be an infinite horizon set up. But I mean, strictly speaking, from a theory point of view, uh, there is just not a monetary equilibrium. So what we want to do is that we want to sort of seek experimental evidence that money is essential. And uh, for that reason, we really want a model where we do have 
uh, a monitor equilibrium. And let me also point out that if you look at the existing literature, so the existing literature typically shows that money improve allocations and then sort of the, the, there is a bit of a debate how, how seriously we should take these problems with there strictly speaking being no monetary equilibrium. But I mean, there are alternative reasons why people in these exp experiments could accept money. They may have different preferences from what we have in our models. Maybe they, they just don't take the experiment seriously or maybe there is some sort of hardwired nature of humankind in terms of wanting to accept money. So what we do is that we wanna sort of cut through all, all that by looking at a really, really simple model. And the model has a finite horizon and it still has a monetary equilibrium. And the short reason for why there is a monetary equilibrium is that there's a lack of common knowledge about whether we're in the last period or not. So uh, what we do then is that we compare that model where we have a three period model with the monetary equilibrium. And then we wanna address essentiality. So we wanna have a control. So we have one model, which is a three period model without a monetary equilibrium. And then a second model where money is essential, where we have a, uh, this three period model with a monetary equilibrium. Let me also, uh, so this is maybe a side point, but I kind of think this is uh, interesting. So uh, models of fiat money, so, so we're not gonna have commodity money. This is a pure fiat money uh, experiment. So they all have multiple equilibrium. And when you think about uh, having a multiple equilibrium in the lab, so we have, uh, uh, we have students in the lab for 15 rounds of play. And then it may be too much to ask for them to actually solve the coordination problem, right? So to address this, we also consider treatments where we sort of act like a mediator in the Nash equilibrium by suggesting participants that they may wanna follow certain strategies. Now, this is kind of frowned upon in, much of experimental econo economics because one worry is that uh, sort of having suggestions may introduce demand effects uh, so, so that the subjects may just want to do what they think that the experimenter wants them to do. But here comes another sort of feature of having this model without a monetary equilibrium. So we make this strategy, uh, strategy suggestions both in the setup where there is a monetary equilibrium and when there is no monetary equilibrium. And hopefully we're gonna be able to sort of uh, control using the, the model with no monetary equilibrium to control for these demand effects uh, based on uh, the belief that we shouldn't have more demand effects in one treatment or the other. That should be kind of independent on um, which, uh, which uh, treatment we're looking at. So, the questions we're asking is, well, do agents use money when there is a monetary equilibrium? Do they use it when there's no monetary equilibrium? And if yes, why? And we are seriously trying to dig into that part by, by looking at something uh, uh, called social value orientation scores and uh, an exit service. And then we want to sort of see the role of the recommendations. And I mean, the, the extent to hope is that the recommendations should help in the settings when there is the monetary equilibrium, but not so much uh, when there is no monetary equilibrium. Now, in terms of the theory here, uh, this is probably the simplest model of money you could imagine, the, the version where uh, money is in equilibrium. And I'm thinking about, uh, Whenever next time, if I ever teach intermediate micro again, then I will, uh, I will use this a model as sort of a simple illustration of Kiyotaki and Bright. So we have three agents. So extent that there's an equal chance that you play one, two, or three, and there are two pairwise meetings. First, one meets two, and then following that meeting, 
uh, two meets three. And uh, the, the lower index agent is uh, the consumer and the higher index guy is, is the producer. So the utility for consumption is some U and the disutility from production is some C and U is uh, greater than C and sufficiently so, so that uh, we uh, can support uh, a monetary equilibrium when we add the lack of common knowledge. So the two setups, model one, well, everyone knows where they are uh, in, in, the, in this uh, trading chain. And then model two, player one knows that they're uh, player one and they, we have to have them know because they stand there with a the coin. The only reason we can explain the stand there with a the coin at the beginning of the monetary treatments is that, well, they know that they're player one. However, the other two agents, one, the ones that have the rules of one and two, they don't know where they are. So they can be played two with probability half and they can be played three with probability half. So, so one question all of this, when you say they know, the, they know the roles, are using words like utility and money and so forth when you, in, in, in the instructions to the, to the players? I know that some experimentalists are very adamant about not trying to frame this at all because otherwise people may not play, you know, what's according to the payoffs, but play according to what they think is going on in real life. So, so in the experimental instructions, we use token for what I refer to as money here in the theory model. And but then why, why even use that? I mean, you could just tell them, I don't know, um, here choices and here payoffs, you know what I mean? I mean, the moment you tell them it's a token, they, I mean, token money, it's not that different. I mean, it's, well, I, well, I'm just raising this because I think some of the experimentalists seem to think it's an issue as far as I know, but I, I don't know about here. Uh, I, I'm, well, so maybe you should address it to Daniela, but, but it, it, the reason why we need to use some sort of words, but maybe not token, is that we have to sort of translate in a simple matter what they do in the trading game to the eventual payoffs they get. And yeah, using in any the word- case, we use the same language for both models. And indeed they use the tokens much less. Uh, in the one where it's not an equilibrium, there is an, the monetary structure is not an equilibrium uh, in the other. Uh, I think we use production decisions. In, we didn't use utility. We just said you gain three points from consumption or you lose one point from production, let's say. I'm not sure that that's what Harold is asking, but but I mean one way where we where it seems to me that we need some word like this is that we want to sort of in an understandable way contrast uh, the model without money to the model with money, and then having some word that they transfer something seems useful for that. I'm not sure whether that's. I just add, man, for token, we do explain them to them very clearly. It does not give them utility or anything. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, you, you, you may use it for, for transaction, but other than that, uh, you cannot be influenced from, from token itself. Uh, we emphasize that for it. It's, it's, it's just when, you know, I mean, people know tokens or money from real life, right? And so things. What, what you want them to do here is understand payoffs and make optimal choices and, and forget about the outside world, right? Isn't, that's the whole point. And, mm -hmm. and I think, especially with things like money or tokens, that's a particularly tricky thing because otherwise you know, it's not, I mean, how do you make sure that, that people have in their mind all the payoffs when they make the choices, when you give them suggestive words? I guess that's a worry, but you know, it, it's, just, it's just something that comes up on occasions. So, but that's mm -hmm. fine. Thank, thanks for clarifying. I mean, I like to put it this way, Errol. I'm not sure Peter totally agrees, but the idea here in my mind is we're doing mechanism design, not non-cooperative game theory. So we are allowed to make suggestions to the agents and you know, if we make them explicitly as we will maybe the next slide, that's legit because- I totally agree on that one, yeah, sure. The suggestions are not best responses, they shouldn't follow them. So, so this is a little bit different. We're definitely using this mechanism design, quote unquote, idea that making suggestions is not necessarily a bad thing. 
No, no that one I'm, I'm totally on board with. I mean, I, it's okay. more the, the wording, the framing. So, yeah. so that yeah. is the analysis. we don't use utility, that's for sure, but we do use token. Yes, but and we use across all treatments also in both models, right? So if they were going to use no matter what, right, it would show. Uh, okay, thank you. I, I should go on because I think I only have like 15 minutes left or something. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, with money, then, okay, let's just use these words now for now. We endowed the first play with money, which is uh, called M here. Now, so what happens in both treatments is that in meeting one, then play one can decide whether or not to offer this uh, token or M to play a two in exchange for production. Play two can seize the offer, accepts or rejects. Then I've shortened down uh, the rules here by just noting that I just uh, skipped the fact that if you in meeting two, you don't have a token, you cannot offer it. But if you do have, if you do have the token, you can offer this M to play three. So play three sees the offer and decides whether or not to produce. Now in model one, where you know when you're player two or three, three will always reject. So by backward induction, we have a unique equilibrium with autarky. Model two, given that U is at least twice the cost of production, there's also a monetary equilibrium where everyone accepts money and money is always offered. So in terms of the experimental design, uh, we look at uh, five different treatments so far. We have four treatments with money. So we look at model one, model two, and then these, uh, these models with and without a recommendation. And so far, the, uh, the non-monetary treatments we've run are model two with no money and no recommendation. And, uh, well, we may have to uh, do a few more non-monetary treatments, but they're kind of boring because we see very little action. So we repeat uh, in 15 times uh, to allow the agents to figure out the incentives of the game. And looking at the tables, it seems like we have to have some, some time for learning. Now, we don't want repeated game effects. And we try to mitigate repeated game effects as much as we can by having random grouping uh, in each game. Now, in terms of uh, also sort of getting the incentive rights and avoid repeated game effects, it, we want to sort of keep the roles of the player, the subjects as stable as possible. So in the model one, while you're randomly assigned to new groups every time, uh, if you're player one or if you're player two, you just keep uh, your role. So you're player two, then you're player two in all 15 rounds. Now, in model two treatments, we can't do that. We still have, if you're player one, you're player one in all 15 rounds. But then in each round, there's a, there's a coin to us to determine if you're not player one, whether you're player two or player three. And then when we have the suggestion, I have just copied exactly what we tell the uh, object, uh, the experimental subjects there. So um, the bottom line is that we just tell them to offer the token and uh, and to uh, produce if and only if they're offered the token. But we're saying that well, this is just a suggestion. Feel free to follow it or not. Now. Uh, again, we are kind of serious to try to sort of figure out what happened, why people are sort of not always uh, playing equilibrium strategies. So after the main experiment, we have an exit survey. We also have a demographic survey, uh, but, uh, and uh, we also have this social value, value orientation to determine sort of how pro-social or altruistic uh, preferences uh, the subjects are. And notice that th this is not just uh, sort of a questionnaire. This is, uh, they play some generalized dictated games. So there's skin in the game uh, when to determine whether sort of how altruistic they are. 
uh, this is stuff that doesn't really, I mean, C tree and O tree, I don't really know what it is. Ask Daniela and Janet. Uh, now, one, one thing that I think is kind of nice is that they are spending 45 to 60 minutes per session and the average earning is 19. So it's, uh, it's quite a lot of money for, for an undergrad, it seems to me, for given the time they put in. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniela, there's also quite a bit of variability in earnings so that if you're, if you're really screwing up, you're not earning much, right? That's true, right? Yes. And what we want to test is that, well, we want, um, hopefully, we, 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 we want the, the equilibrium model, the model where money is in equilibrium to have more action than in the model where we, where we don't have uh, uh, money being in equilibrium. And, uh, and we also want uh, that uh, money should make uh so in model two where we have a monetary equilibrium that we we should see significantly more production when there is money than when there's not so uh i think i skipped over this but without money in every in both models there's just auto keys and equilibrium and then uh the hope is that production should be enhanced by having a suggestion in in the second mo model two but not in model one so uh, in terms of how it looks like. So just asking, well, so does money help? Now, so this is in model two with and without money. So we see that uh, this is where learning is important. So early on, there is quite a bit of, uh, of production even when there is no money, which is inconsistent with equilibrium but it sort of rapidly falls to almost zero. Whereas with money, we see that uh, the decline levels off and, and we have like 60% production, uh, roughly speaking. And this is the same stuff summarized as the table where we see that uh, again, uh, I mean, the message is just what I told you. So let me not dwell on this table. Now, uh, comparing now model one, so that's the blue line here, which is the model with no monetary equilibrium, and model two uh, in uh, treatments where we do have money, we see that there is a bit of production here in uh, model one, but there's like a huge difference. So uh, unlike some experiments we run previously in, in, that are published in a different paper, where these, where we actually reverse these roles. Now in these experiments, we, we get it right in terms of the theory so that uh, money being in equilibrium seems to be sort of crucial in being able to support significant use of money. And again, I, we have this as the picture and as a table and the, the message of the table is exactly the same as the picture. Now, here it looks maybe a little bit uh, less convincing here, but here we have uh, the impact of uh, strategy suggestions. And while when you eyeball this, it's not so clear, uh, when you actually look at the tables and look at, uh, uh, and look at uh, significance levels, et cetera, uh, in, when we do strategy uh, suggestions uh, uh, in model one, which is the one without a monetary equilibrium, they help a little bit early on. Now, the magnitude is not so big, but in terms, the difference between model one and model two is that uh, in model two, uh, there is a significantly positive effect from the strategy suggestion. And that's true for early periods, middle periods, and late periods. So again, this seems to be consistent with, uh, uh, with, with theory. And uh, here we see that uh, expressed as a table. Now, this may not be like what 
we this isn't what we looked for initially, but it may be some of the most interesting stuff here. So the idea now when we wrote down model two is that, well, the producer doesn't know which meeting, uh, if it's meeting two or me meeting three. So then uh, because of that, uh, th that ignorance, if everyone is producing in every meeting, then it's a best response uh, to produce for M if you know that, well, so there's a 50-50 probability that I'm screwed, uh, but with, with a 50% chance, I'm gonna go into another meeting and then somebody's gonna produce for me. So that means that uh, actually producing is the best response. Now, looking at the data, uh, we broke the data up by meeting. So we looked at the production rate in meeting one and the production rate in meeting two. And lo and behold, uh, there is a bit of a difference. I mean, it's not the, the uh, it's not big, big, but there's a significant difference in terms of the production rate so that people produce more in meeting one than in meeting two, despite them being supposed to be ignorant as to whether uh, there is meeting one or meeting two. Now, uh, the explanation of this, which actually some, some of them um, told us that they did this, is that some subjects used waiting, waiting time to infer whether they were in meeting one or meeting two, so that they figured that if it takes a really long time uh, from the last uh, interaction to, to this interaction to get the offer, they're most likely gonna be in meeting two. So that is that uh, waiting time was used as, uh, as a noisy signal of uh, whether it's meeting one and meeting two. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of flabbergasted because whenever you talk about experiments, there are sort of these questions, do they actually, can they add one plus one or uh, are, they, are these undergrads smarter than bacteria cultures, et cetera? I mean, this is, this is really, really sophisticated behavior. And, uh, and so, so it seems that uh, in terms of the experimental subjects, I mean, maybe some of them were not so sophisticated, but, but some of them are really, really sophisticated in doing these, uh, I think unexpected things. And let me also point out that you may worry now if they use waiting time uh, as, uh, as a noisy signal, well, then maybe the monetary equilibrium would fall apart. Well, it would if the signal is precise enough, but as we actually sort of work out in the paper, as long as the noisy signal uh, is sufficiently impre imprecise, then the model still admits uh, a partially monetary equilibrium where there's gonna be some meetings where we have no production, but with production in most meetings. So how, do, how does it work? I mean, yeah, if, if you time... have two minutes. Okay, sorry. I, I, I no, 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 it, it, sorry, I just is... said, Peter, you have two minutes. I mean, if time is discreet, it would seem to unravel from the back again, no? If you say last no. minute, nobody would accept money, then the second to last minute, nobody should accept well, money. So, so it, it depends on sort of how you, I mean, th th that you, you could sort of think of it as um, you could set up a model where it would unravel, but it depends on sort of how, how you, how you sort of cluster, uh, how, how, how you, how the perception of, of, of time. So if, if you say that, well, so it could be a long time, it could be a middle time, or it could be a short time. If you sort of have this sort of uh, uh, non-precise uh, measure of time, which seems reasonable to me when when it's happening into your in your head, then it doesn't unravel. So then, the, so the key is that l the late time that there has to be positive probability that it's the first and the second meeting in the late time as well as in the middle time. So there has so so you, you have to sort of you, you have to model uh, the first and and the second meeting, and I don't think that's unreasonable. 
so, so I mean, there, there are richer ways of doing it as well. We we have the absolutely simple way in the paper, and uh, feel free to take a look. I think it makes some sense. So this is just uh, showing you. So in model, so how the difference between the production in the two meetings in model two are here on the right, and then in model one, it's not such a surprise because I think previous experiments have, even though you, you should go to zero in both meeting one and meeting two, at least in meeting one, you have the, you, you can hope that the guy in meeting two, uh, so if you meet in meet, meeting one, then you can hope for an idiot following uh, the guy. So, so th this is consistent with what people are finding in other uh, experiments. And that's as a table. Now, very quickly, because I'm basically out of time. So we have some deviations from theory. So in particular, uh, production by player three in model one seems to be just dumb, right? And also production in by players two and three in model two when they're not offering mo offered money, that is uh, that's significantly different from zero. And I mean, when I said it was dumb, well, maybe not. Maybe they have some social pro-social preferences, or I mean, they could either be confused, have pro-social preferences, or whatnot. But we do look at this. Uh, uh, the social value orientation scores and exit service to uh, figure that one out. And I think another really interesting part of what we find is that the measure of social minded preferences uh, that is the sort of standard score that everyone is using, it doesn't at all explain these anomalies. There's zero predictive value from these social value orientation scores. Well, in contrast to that, when we look at the exit service, well, then one sort of one key reason why people say that they do these, uh, in theory, um, these deviations from theory producing as player three in model one, for example, is that they want to help the other player. So somehow there, there seems to be like a bit of a disconnect between what we get in the SVO score and what we what we get from the exit service. And, and then the exit service also, I mean, you do see things like people explain their behavior as, well, I hope that I'm gonna be player one in the future, which it can never be. Uh, and that's the explanation for why they do what they do. And, and so th there is just a bit of confusion so to conclude, um, we look at these, I think, really interesting uh, sort of questions that I think can pinpoint better than previous literature, whether uh, money being an equilibrium is the reason why people use money in these experiments. And we get largely results that are consistent with theory and then we see what I think is really interesting that some subjects being remarkably sophisticated uh, in the exit service, we can conclude that some are remarkably unsophisticated. Now, what we haven't really figured out yet is uh, how to combine these sophisticated guys with the unsoph unsophisticated guys and whether that may have some sort of interesting theoretical predictions that uh, one could sort of test in the lab, but that's uh, just uh, for future work. And thank you. I'm happy to take questions now or uh, in the chat or whatever. I think we are a bit out of time. So uh, we have one minute for questions, but uh... I do prefer we just uh, directly start the next talk. You, you're you guys are like, great. Uh, an authoritarian, I think. <laughs> okay, that's good. Then uh, uh, this is going to be our last talk today. And ha Harald Wulik from Chicago is going to give us a keynote speech. Uh, Harald, you can share your slides now.
Yeah, thank you. Too. Thank you, Yuzu. Awesome. I, I noticed that my internet connection occasionally is, is troubling me today. So I, I put the link to the slides in the Dropbox, uh, in, uh, to the link to the slide in the chat window. Sorry about this. But let me hey, also listen, share the screen here. Start. Yuzu said I was supposed to introduce you, so I made an outline of things to say. So oh, I, I see. Oh, okay. Uh, please go. <laughs> it's not deep, but um, Harold Lulig is, Lulig is one of the great macroeconomists of our generation. I met him on a bus when he was on the LSE tour. I happened to be in London working with Kiyotaki, and I've followed his career ever since then. His first interesting paper I knew about was there's a big controversy about the law of large numbers and continuum economies. And he said, it's easy, just interpret it as a Pettis integral. And I never really understood that, but I thought it was quite elegant. <laughs> Harold's a fellow of the, my dogs are barking here, ignore that. Harold's a fellow of the Econometric Society, past editor of JPE, Econometrica, RES, JDC, Handbook of Macro. There's a lot of important work, including this AER paper on rules of thumb versus dynamic programming. Lots of work on unit roots. Recently, he's been working on electronic money, and that's why he's here today. And I'm very happy to have him contributing to our area of inquiry. I'll be very brief because time's up the yes, And I'll say two things that I really like about Harold. First, he's a big fan of mixed martial arts. To me, that's important. Second, this is his greatest attribute. Paul Krugman doesn't like him. To me, that's a real badge of honor. So without further ado, here is my good friend, Harold Ulrich. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Randy. That's super kind. And let me add to that. I don't like Paul Krugman particularly either. So, so it's probably neutral. So uh, thanks. Uh, let me share my slides here. Let's see. I, I guess I didn't manage to do this yet. Sorry about this. Thank you so much. This is really kind. I'm glad to be here. And I was told that, uh, you know, maybe I should give a bit more of a, you know, lofty bird's eye um, view on the topic rather than present a paper. I mean, I've, I have some paper presentation with all kinds of equations ready to go, but I figured I'd try to put this together a little bit and touch on these papers and touch on the topic in general. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be lighter than just presenting the theory papers themselves. But I'm going to, so I want to talk about digital currencies. And thinking about digital currencies, I, I encourage people, in particular in this conference, but also PhD students, others, to think about this because you know there's a lot of happening in the future, and and that's our real house, right? We can we can think of you know mechanism design questions as Randy's mentioning of monetary questions. You know, ahead of time before all this, uh, you know, is, is, is playing out. So, so what I want to talk about is, you know, kind of the battlefield, how I see it emerging, um, you know, looking out at, you know, what, what, what you read in newspapers and so forth. But then I also want to give you a taste of my research. Um, I've been writing a few papers with a variety of co authors, and, um, and yes, uh, six of them. And I'm going to talk about the, the two that are in, in bold in particular. So they're, they're sort of coming in, in topics. But anyway, so I want to talk about you know, private cryptocurrencies first. And, and there I want to talk about Bitcoin in particular. I'm not going to talk much about the blockchain, actually. Um, there's the issue of what happens if these cryptocurrencies become really large and what that means internationally for international monetary policy or for monetary policy implications, maybe with sticky prices even. Think El Salvador, so maybe maybe firms will post prices in in Bitcoin, and it's going to be sticky. And if you knew Keynesian, you know that's something to to think about. So I have that in the paper. And then lastly, I want to think about central bank digital currencies and, and, and give you an assessment at the end. Okay, so let me let me dive right in. Um, so um, so so I think it's really fascinating. We having we having this 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 battlefield, as I want to call it, um, there's going to be, they're, they're privately issued cryptocurrencies. And this all started in, in seriousness in 2008 with this Nakamoto paper. Uh, could talk at length about Nakamoto and, and, you know, nobody knows who he is and what he invented. And, and certainly came along with a new technology, the blockchain. The blockchain is fascinating, but in some ways it separates me at least from the question of 
of cryptocurrencies per se. It's important for some aspects, not important for others. Anyways, I'm not going to talk about blockchain. I think it's super fascinating, but I don't have so much time. So today we have several thousand cryptocurrencies. We have entry by big players going to come. I mean, Facebook for now is trying to get the foot in the door. Once Facebook is through, I think you're going to see Walgreens and Amazons and General Electric, what have you, doing the same thing. So I think there's going to be big going forward. I mean, that's that's my crystal ball. It may, may all be false, of course. Now, central banks are now under pressure to do something similar, right? So here are all these private guys, you know, introducing cell phones and the central banks can't be sticking to the landline. So they have to introduce cell phones as well. And they want to introduce central bank digital currencies. I think that's that's the main um, that's the main reason, perhaps. But all of that competes with traditional means of payments, cash, of course, deposit accounts. But you also have credit cards. You have things like PayPal. You have fast retail payment systems. I mean, once you're familiar with yourself with fast retail payment systems, not entirely clear what the selling point for central bank digital currencies is. And all of this, you know, it's an, it's an interesting. What emerges here is an interesting. Uh, you know, monetary world that that in particular this crowd is is you know is is just you you guys are the experts on this so so I just encourage you to think uh, of all of this as this unfolds and I know that many in the audience already have so I'm, I'm so I'm just uh, you know stating this one issue that I wish I could talk about but I won't today is this whole issue of privacy with criminal activity you know know your customer is. Is, is the battle cry in the, in the finance industry, but criminals don't like that. And, and how, do we, how do we think about this? How do we relate that all? I mean, I think it's a super tricky question. Should you be able to do anonymous transactions and to what degree and what are the trade-offs there? Okay, so here are the private cryptocurrencies. And you know, just to highlight that, it's probably known this audience, but it's, it's, I think it's always good to emphasize, you know, people tend to think of you know, cryptocurrencies as Bitcoin, which of course is, oops, wait a second here, sorry about this, which is this big thing here, right? This here is from uh, from this website. It's a, that's a super cool website. You can just open it and you can zoom in on any of these. Um, and Bitcoin is still, you know, the largest by market capitalization, maybe about 30 to 40%, maybe 40%, I would say, of total market capitalization in the cryptocurrency market. But there are many others, you know, Ethereum and there's the Ada coin, um, this is Tether and, and so forth. And we could, you know, when you go to this website, you can actually click on any of these and, and get more information. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just remarkable. It keeps on going. Dog coin started as a joke and it has become pretty big and so forth. So total market cap um, as of yesterday for cryptocurrencies is, is, is a bit above 2 trillion. And if you compare that to currency circulation in the United States, that's also about two trillion. So they're on the same order of magnitude. Um, now you could argue that maybe cryptocurrency should be thought of as, uh, you know, compared to currency in total in the entire world. Um, that may be right, but um, um, you know, it's it's just putting that in perspective. All right. So now my first paper. But, uh, you know, that's now, you know, somewhat older. I mean, that's the first paper we, we wrote and got published with Linda Schilling. It, we, we wanted to think about Bitcoin only. We wanted to think about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. We don't go into all the details underlying Bitcoin. Um, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin in competition with something like the dollar. And then, and then get at some questions that I think uh, seem to be on people's mind when they, when they, when you know, non-monetary economists, non-economists talk about uh, cryptocurrencies. They say, you know, how come this has a positive price at all? Right? I mean, this this is just a bubble. This is just uh, this will just go away. This will just implode, right? There's no obviously Bitcoin has no dividends, so the net present value of dividends are zero. So how come that the price is above that? Well, anybody in this crowd, of course, knows the answer to that. You know, fiat currencies have the same feature, right? I mean. If you have fiat currencies, they can have a positive price, but despite the fact that they don't pay off, you know, real dividends. They just can just be useful as medium of exchange. So then you can ask the question: Well, can Bitcoin serve as medium of exchange despite the price volatility? And again, this is about the future. You know, maybe Bitcoin isn't used that much as medium of exchange, although in El Salvador it will be. Uh, but I think increasingly so. It's going to be used for payments here and there. 
and I, I could give you a number of examples. Um, people worry that maybe with price volatility, it wouldn't be useful medium of exchange. And then finally, what are the monetary policy implications? So I'm gonna give you the key insights. I'm gonna show you a little bit of the model. And I think uh, the purpose of doing this is not just to present this paper. I, I, I like to do that, of course, and to sell that too, but also to just point to these questions and point to these answers as things that I think are worth pursuing further. I think there's there's interesting things in there that you know our paper did a, did a start on, but by no means concluded the questions. So in the paper, we, we give you a new model of an endowment economy with two intrinsically worthless currencies used as a medium of exchange. I'm going to tell you what's what's kind of new about this compared to maybe some of the other models out there and why we think that's useful. And then from that, um, we first rediscover, we should really say, what we call a fundamental pricing equation. The special case of that is that Bitcoin price is a martingale. And that equation is really a version of the Carrick and Wallace indeterminacy result that we knew, of course, and then and then we became aware of Manuel and Peck, which had written down the stochastic version. So it's 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 their result. They have it from a different uh, model, but nonetheless, all credit goes to them. We get a no speculation theorem, which really means that that people don't hold on to these things for a long time. They they spend them, and and that's a challenge because that's probably not what we see. So why do people hold on to them? It's a really interesting question that you might want to think about once you have this fundamental pricing equation. Now, once people spend all the currencies, you get merely the result that volatility does not invalidate medium of exchange function because it's, it's just used. And you're getting rewarded. That's the that's a pricing equation, just get rewarded for the volatility by the appropriate risk premium. The risk premium could be negative, of course. It's just saying that as in any as asset pricing situation, if there are fluctuations and you're holding the asset and you're demanding the risk premium that comes out from the usual correlations, and that's that's the market price, and that's it. That doesn't invalidate minimum of exchange function. If you think about people in El Salvador, they're complaining, oh, wait, maybe you know, Bitcoin could lose value if I accept this Bitcoin. Well, Bitcoin could also go up in value, right? And so, um, you know, there are two signs to that coin, and at the end of the day, prices will simply reflect that. Now, here's an interesting point. The monetary policy implications, um, we're seeing all these Bitcoin block rewards paid to miners. And you might think that they're tax on Bitcoin holders. You know, that, that's what a you know, single currency perspective would suggest in a senior age perspective. But that's not going to be true here because you're having two currencies. They actually finance with a dollar tax. So it's the, it's, the, it's the Federal Reserve that pays the Bitcoin miners. I mean, uh, it's, uh, think about that. So, okay. So here's the model um, in, in, in one page, and then I'm going to show you a picture uh, expressing that. So time is discrete, um, infinite. There's randomness drawn at the beginning of period. There's one perishable consumption good per period, and there are two monies. So we call them Bitcoin and dollars, and that, that's the aggregates. And there's a central bank that steers a quantity of dollars per making lump sum transfers to agents. So there are these tall T plus one, and they can just increase the quantity of dollars or decrease it. And, and, and these are just helicopter drops. And their goal is that they implement some exogenous price path for PT. I mean, just going to assume throughout the paper they are capable of doing that. I mean, how, you know, just do it, right? I mean, central banks seem to be remarkably capable. We're not going to, you know, that's not, that's not the purpose of the paper to explain how. But the Bitcoin quantity is deterministic and, and, and just increases at some AT. In the paper, we actually assume that AT will be gradually decreasing over time which gives rise to some other results, but that's not super essential. The essential thing is that it's just endowment, that's just deterministic. And you could maybe just receive this as an endowment. In the later part of the paper, we also have mining where people have to put in effort to get this AT, but it doesn't really change anything else. What happened? Hello, Harad, are you still there? You seem to have lost him. I think he froze. Yeah, it's connection, something. Yeah, I think he wants us to take it from here. Obviously, we're all his students, so we should be able to. This is a test, I think. OK, let me.
Randy, do you have his cell phone? Just text him or something. Just let oh, him I know. Do. He might not know. Okay, then I will just send him my email. He's back. Harold, you're still muted. Oh, Harold, you are back. Okay. So yeah, um, sorry, yeah, my my Wi-Fi just threw me out. I you know it's really <laughs> Zoom. So okay. Um, so okay, good. I, I realized that something was wrong. Okay, so that's the model. So we have these two types of agents, red and green. Um, red consume in all periods and have endowments in even periods, green the other way around. So, and, and, and they trade goods for money. So that's the only thing they can do. They, do, they are not bonds and so forth. Um, now, in contrast on OLG model, maybe that's, that, that's what I want to emphasize. The agents do not need to spend all their monies. Uh, so they can be hodlers. And I think that's, uh, that's something that we wanted. We wanted agents to be able to speculate by just hanging on to the money for a couple of periods. Um, and they don't have to accept our money either, right? And, but what we show in the paper, and I just remark on this, we get this no speculation result. They will, they will spend all the money or they, and they will accept all money. And that just requires a mild assumption on, on, on impatience, essentially. So that was surprising to us and frustrating to us, I must say, because we wanted to get, we wanted to get these hodlers in there and we wanted to get the hodlers in there for reasons other than just, they just want to save, right? And we know that you can write down IRR style model. Uh, can I ask you a money. question about the hodlers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I, what, what I'm struggling to understand about the hodlers, so the hodlers love Bitcoin, so they want to never spend it, but then how do they conduct their daily expenses? Like, do they have a small dollar account for daily expenses and they hold on to their Bitcoin? Because in that well, case, they would be the opposite of people who only use Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, there are two, two currencies here and you need currency to, uh, to buy stuff. So you could have, um, you know, you could have a bunch of dollars and a bunch of Bitcoins. And, and you decide not to spend your Bitcoins, only partially spend it, right? And um, no, I mean, the, only the use the dollars. Hodlers, what, are they, what are they actually doing? Well, the hodlers, so a hodler, a hodler, so hodler is the is a word that appeared in that literature for holder, right? So people, people that just hold on to Bitcoin rather than spending them. And that can, agents are allowed to do this here, right? I mean, you get into the market, you're having some dollars, you're having some Bitcoin, you want to buy yourself some goods and you say, you know what? I'm not going to spend all my Bitcoin. I'm just going to hang on to them. I'm now, it's now my turn. I want to consume and I have to pay for the consumption using money. I'm going to only use my dollars, but I'm not going to spend all my Bitcoin. I just hang on to some of them. Maybe hang on to all of the Bitcoin. You want to consume. So if you want to consume, you better use some money. And But there's dollars available for you to spend. So it's not a, it's not a constraint on you in principle. It's just that at the end of the day, you don't want to do this. And, and, and that requires sort of thinking through the incentives of the sellers and the buyers here at the end of the day. Um, so, so, so it's not done, right? I mean, even though, you know, the budget constraints allow you that you don't spend all your money, at the end of the day in equilibrium, that's not the action you take. You will always spend all your money. And that means also that Bitcoin you know, the, no matter the, the price evolution, um, is a useful as medium of exchange here. And here's a picture, if you like. So there are these red agents, red agents and the green agents. So this is an odd period here. The green agent produces, he has some apple, he sells it to the red agent who consumes it. Where does the red agent have the money from? Well, from previous selling of stuff, right? So you're seeing that I mean, you're getting some dollars, the green agent here, right? It's getting dollars in Bitcoin, maybe from the red agents. I mean, you have to talk about the price. Um, I mean, there's competitive market price. That's what we're assuming here, not, not bargaining. And then you carry this into the next period, plus there may be some mining, some central bank into injection. And then the green agent can use the currency again to buy the endowment good from the red agents. So it's this back and forth. You know, you could also do this mornings and afternoons if, if you prefer that, but that's the timing. Okay. So we get this, we get this uh, Mart, you know, Martingale result, and it really just says that risk weighted, and we, and we could also divide by one over U prime CT if you want to multiply the whole thing with beta to get a stochastic discount 
factor in the in the usual way, but it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, what you care about is the U prime CT plus one risk weighted. The real return on dollar has to be the same as the real return on Bitcoin. That's what this that's what this says. It's an unsurprising equation. The, so the result is actually even deeper than that. We can show in the paper that this is pretty much it. I mean, that is, um, you know, th this Martingale constraint is the only constraint constraining equilibrium. And you can, you know, you, you might say, well, you know, I mean, just looking at that, you know, say, well, maybe exchange are still constant for some reason. No, they are not, right? I mean, that's all there is to it. And, and you can construct lots and lots of equilibria. I mean, that's all in the online appendix. I mean, there's lots of clever construction. How you can make risk premium positive and negative in, if you want. Um, and, I, and I think that's really cool personally, but it appeared in the technical appendix as that's, that's life. Anyways, um, in the, you know, in the, in the simplest case, that just means the Bitcoin price is a martingale. And not martingale in the, in the sense that, that there's going to be some average, you know, interest rate in it. No, it's going to dollar. I mean, it's going to have the same expected return as dollar, and the nominal return on dollar is has a zero interest rate, and so the nominal return on Bitcoin is zero. And uh, when people ask me what do I expect the Bitcoin price to be, you know, ten years from now, I say about fifty thousand dollars because that's what it's trading at today. I haven't checked the exact number, and obviously, you know, that's not what we have seen. So that's another challenge. How come this equation? You know, is this equation describing the data? Is it not? Then uh, you know, maybe it is. So, okay. Now here's here's why Bitcoin rewards are actually financed by dollar taxes. And and in this model, what we're having is a quantity theory equation. You know, uh, old style if you like, but but really useful. You're just paying for all the goods YT out there, and there's going to be some price level PT. And how do you pay for that? You're paying for that, right? Because there's no speculation. You're paying for that with the total amount of dollars and the total bound of bitcoins. You know, multiplied with the price QT. Okay. So now that means I can you can write down two equilibria which which are indistinguishable. They have the same price fluctuations. They have the same PT path. This, you know, consumption is exogenous here at the end anyways, right? Because all the goods are traded back and forth. So it's, it's not exogenous. I mean, the trading happens, but in equilibrium, people eat what's, what's produced. So all of that stays the same. The only difference between these two equilibrium may be that they're more Bitcoin, the one equilibrium than the other one, maybe because there's mining in one, there's not mining in the other one. There's 80 zero in the one case and 80 is non-zero in the other words. You know, same equations. And, but if you leave QT the same and you have a higher BT, you see immediately what you need to have is a lower DT here. And that's a sense in which uh, uh, these, these Bitcoin block rewards in which the increase in Bitcoin you know, is, is financed by decreasing dollars here, by, by decreasing dollars less compared to the equilibrium in which these um, increases in Bitcoin wouldn't happen. So the Fed is paying for the... Uh, blockchain rewards, it's paying the miners. Um, they really do, I mean, it's uh, okay, <laughs> you know, indirectly. All right, um, and that also has some, you know, monetary policy implications. Again, normally, you know, in, a, in, a, in quantity theory, this is like, uh, you know, it's a simple monetary economics here, you pick the velocity equal to one, you get this, you get this equation. How do, you, how do you steer the price level? Well, you just steer the money supply and that's it. But now we are market clear and we have these two pieces here. BT, remember, it's exogenous, but DT and QT are now both endogenous, right? DT is chosen by the central bank and QT is, satisfies this martingale equation. Okay. So, you know, one way of thinking about this is sort of a conventional perspective where you say, well, given the price for Bitcoin, you have to solve for DT that makes that uh, equation hold. But you can also think about the other way around. And I think that's fascinating, something we're thinking about. You know, given them, you know, you, there's, maybe the central bank picks DT so as to force QT to be a particular price. So there's a sense in which you could think about equilibria in which it's possible for the central bank to not only, you know, pick the price of PT, but even pick the exchanges with the price of the Bitcoin. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it, the paper is a little loose on that, but I just want to raise this issue because I think this interaction of the Bitcoin price with monetary policy and this whole issue of how the blockchain rewards finance, I think is an interesting one. And this, this gets us started. I had two pictures here. Let me skip them in the interest of time. Uh, Harold, um, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to bug you down a bit. 
Um, I would like to come back to the uh, uh, the uh, Martingale result. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's probably a stupid question, but usually, you know, we have a beta in front of this ET, so we have the discount factor. Yeah. Then this would be the Freeman rule. Uh, so why? Where is this beta? Well, well, again, no, no. I mean, you could, you could. Uh, I mean, that's that's what I indicated here. You can multiply both sides with ah, okay. beta times divided by one over u prime ct, right? And then indeed it would have this usual, usual more familiar format. And if you like that more, that's fine. I don't know why we ended up writing it this way, but that, one, that that's the same thing. It's just a question of you know et and then mt plus one times this whole thing, right? And it's 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 not the Friedman rule. It just says the expected return, the expected real return on either currency must might be the same. So if high inflation on dollar, that means the real return on dollar is low, right? That's that's what this would say, and that also would say that the real return on Bitcoin would have to be low, right? I mean, so yeah. extreme case is where QT is constant, right? QT equals constant. You can just QT is constant, right? It would drop here, it would drop here, but and if, then you see if, both equations are the same, and that's a Carrick and Wallace. Uh, exchange in the terminus to result, but actually exchange it once they fix the date, you know, they're constant. Yeah. The classic version is that they become Martin I thought this was comparing two different dates. It's comparing two different monies at the same date. Ah, okay, okay, okay. That's why but, we were but then, yeah, but then if the Fed is running the Freeman rule, you will have that. Oh, then uh, PT over uh, PT plus one would be, in that case, if they run the Freeman rule, right, then this will be R, right? The, the re return yeah. and, then, and then you're gonna have your your hodlers back in the picture no well not here because there really aren't we don't have any other means of well let's see here um yeah i think we have to i think we have to be away from the freedom rule. i think you're right i think the okay. the results that i showed you i mean they require some mild assumptions including you have to be away from the freedom rule and um, okay thanks so that's yeah that's a fair point Okay, so so then there's you know what happens if there are these uh, big currencies introduced Libra DM you know by Facebook and uh, slide here goes into some detail. We're probably going to have more players in the future. Um, you know the DM is still battling it out with the regulators, but I think increasingly they may be getting there. But it's it's sort of a you know it, it's it's a it's getting the foot in the door and once DM is through, maybe maybe this is going to expand, right? I mean, with Bitcoin, the regulators say, eh, you don't care, it's just small potatoes, although that's grown a lot, right? But DM, you know, that's that that's a game changer. And I think that's what regulators and central banks are really worried about. And, you know, suddenly uh, the monopoly of making money is no longer a monopoly. And, you know, if, you mon if, the, if you're the monopolist, i.e. the central bank, naturally you're worried about this. And indeed, my papers here with, uh, with Pierre Paul Benigno, Linda Schilling, and uh, you know, you're getting into this. So once you have a large cryptocurrency trading like this, it actually puts a lot of pressure on the national uh, national monetary policies to either coordinate or to just even lose your own currency as medium of exchange. But I want to touch about on the last topic, my remaining ten minutes here, which is uh, central bank digital currencies. So central bank digital currencies now seem to be developed as a response largely to these cryptocurrencies developments. Uh, there actually is a CBDC, that's that's from the BIS website in, in the Bahamas and the in the Eastern Caribbeans, um, but, but China and uh, Sweden, you know, they're very close to introducing it, they're having test pilots and many other central banks are thinking about it. So, so what are the issues arising with central bank digital currencies then? Well, um, what's this, what is a central bank digital currency? You can think about it various ways. We take this body of Kumov definition that is an account held by households at the central bank. It's likely to be introduced widely. Um, it, it, it may offer financial inclusion where people that don't have access to bank accounts now can make digital payments and on Amazon and so forth. So I guess that's a good thing. But um, you know, various people have have pointed out that there could be disintermediation threat, right? If you know, especially younger households. I mean, think of them. If you ask them, do you have a landline? They look at you like, what are you talking about, right? They only have a cell phone. They don't have a home phone anymore, and it could be doing the same. I mean, once once people have CBDC in their in their you know on their cell phones or wherever their computer, why on earth 
would you still want to have a you know deposit account? I mean, and, and maybe uh, deposit accounts dwindle; uh, they go the way of you know uh, shoe horses and so and the landlines and so forth. And so the banks got to do something because if they don't, then banks uh, cannot fund firms anymore. And this whole financial system may be maybe under threat. And there are two solutions to that, I guess, you know, aside from not introducing CBDs in the first place. One is you could say, oh, don't worry, the banks will do something attractive so that the households reinvest the CBDC at banks. And that's, uh, that's a point that Duffy often makes. Or you could take the perspective, well, maybe the central bank should somehow get the act and refund the banks of projects. And this is path through argument by Bruno Meyer and Niepelt. And if you look at the literature that, that many of you have contributed and that has, has been appearing on CBDC, you know, they typically have at least one of the two features, maybe both uh, baked into them. And it's kind of interesting to think through these two options. So, he, so my paper with Linda and Tres Fernandes Villaverde that builds on a paper that I, that the three of us, you know, where, where, where also Daniel Sanchez was involved and that was published in Red, which I highly recommend reading. This one is still a working paper. Um, we look at all this. And, and we say, okay, fine, you know, no more banks, right? No more households. The central bank has, has, uh, has a CBDC. It needs to somehow finance maybe the banks, but let's just, let's just, you know, cut this all short. Let's just take out all the middlemen here and, and strip away the veal and, and all the fog and let's just have the central bank run the project. You're not arguing that that's what they end up doing. It's just for the purpose of thinking through what's going to happen. This makes it simple. I mean, maybe these firms and the banks are really important. All of this, they probably are. I'm not arguing they're not, but but just in order to make the point that we want to make, that makes it as simple as possible. Okay, so only households, only the central bank and the projects, and the central bank now becomes this financial intermediary. And some people have said, well, that's a great thing. You know, now that the central bank is running, it's no more runs because uh, no more bank fragility because it's, you know, the central bank can always deliver its nominal obligations, right? I mean, the bank may not, right? And maybe you have to do some of the deposit insurance, but the central bank, you know, if you come there with $10, it, it just gives you $10 back and, and that seems to be the end of it. Well, there's still versions of this, you know, financial fragility that's in Diamond Dipic that, uh, that maybe you can get around, but it's still at the heart of the whole matter. It hasn't disappeared. And, uh, and if they happen, there are spending ones in available goods. And that means that now, um, you know, you have to really worry about accomplishing, you know, which objectives you can accomplish, right? There's a traditional central bank objective of you know, maintaining price stability. I mean, there's, you know, decades of literature. And so we're not reinventing the real on that one. There's in the paper, there's no reason why price should be stable, but, you know, if you want me to write, you know, cite 200 papers on that, I'm happy to do so. And it's enshrined in various laws and so forth. We take that as a given. But you also want efficiency. Um, that means optimum risk sharing in the diamond dipic world, and you want uh, and you want to avoid these runs. You want to maybe design the mechanism in such a way that runs don't happen. Hey, Aaron, the key result is. Mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned if, if people start putting their money in central bank digital currency, you'll drive the commercial banks out of business. So what are we going to do? Maybe the central bank will have to lend to investors. Yeah, there's, there's another option. The central bank could take these deposits, lend it to commercial banks, and they could lend it to investors. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's sort of this picture here, right, where the central bank, you know, like lends because the private commercial banks, you know, they have a better incentive and ability to find good projects. Oh yeah, totally. No, no. I, I, I mean, I, I hundred percent agree. And we don't want to say, you know, we, we're not saying. I mean, in, in fact, we are. We want to very much say that that's, you know, this is what, you know, this is one route and that's a route that we envision, right? Where the central bank would now, you know, find, refinance the banks by buying their bonds somehow and then the banks go and find the good projects and all of that. And obviously that's important. It's just that for the purpose of this piece of the analysis, right? I mean, you could write down the banks, we could write down the firms and just make them a veer and then, then we would just have more notation for the purpose of what we do, right? Now, I, I totally agree that the other issues arising that are outside the paper where these firms and the banks are important. But for the purpose that we do, I, I think we can just shortcut all of this and just have the central bank fund these projects directly. So that's, that's the only reason. It's just a simplification. It's not, we're not arguing the central banks ends up finding the projects. The central bank will fund banks, which then funds projects. But just to, you know, just to cut down on tangential 
what seem to be tangential details of the model, we just cut it short. So, so that's that's the idea. But that, but it's a good point because you know, I mean, thanks for that question because oftentimes you know people ask us, this looks really weird. We don't think central banks funding projects. And and I was want to say no no indeed center, the central bank is not going to fund the project of course not right they're going to lend to banks and they're going to do something but at the end of the day if you strip it all out if you see what's happening the central bank becomes the ultimate financial intermediary and ultimately one way or the other funds these projects and that's something worth thinking about okay so. Um, there, we have a real side to the model, which I'm going to skip. That's just time and dip week, you know that. And there's going to be, you know, some some long term project here. Invest one real unit in time zero can be liquidated for one unit in time one, or capital R units in time two. There's also the less efficient storage utility, and you want to do this, you know, impatient patient agents uh, risk sharing that in. That means that you have to give the impatient agents more than one unit of consumption goods in period one. So that's all standard and you teach that and you know that, so let me skip that. We layer over that the nominal model in which the central bank now introduces the CBDC. And what do we mean by that? We have to introduce, the central bank is now running these projects. So we have to say what the central bank does. So it, 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 sell, it, it takes the real goods from the agents and gives them M CBDC units in T equals one. You can think of that as being interest rate on some amount that they got in time equals zero, some price limit P equals zero. You know, time zero here, you know, you know, the only thing that happens there is that agents want to know how much, how much M do they have in T equals one. That's that's a key thing here. And that's why we uh, shortcut that too. Now, now um, agents learn their type in T equals one, and then the impatient agents will certainly spend the M. But the patient agents may also spend some of the monetary balances. And so the total fraction of agent spending will be some N that's between lambda and the total N. Okay, and now we assume the central bank observes this aggregate spending fraction. And depending on that, they decide how much to liquidate from the long-term project and also what nominal interest rate to pay on the monetary balances. But remember the monetary balance, the the interest, rate, interest rates are always set one period in advance. So the nominal interest rate, what it does is it's changing how much money people have in their pocket in time, time two. So the remaining agents get the, nomin, the, the, the money times, you know, plus the interest in time two and spend it there. Okay, so here's a, here's a boring picture of a liquidation policy. Always liquidate the same thing. You know, pick the nominal interest rate equal to zero. So that will be one. You can certainly draw more interesting ones. Okay, so um, equilibrium, market clearing. The thing that I want to talk about market clearing here is that at the end of the day, the agents only care about the real allocation and the real allocation only depends on the liquidation policy. It doesn't depend on all this monetary stuff. So once you know why N, you know how much real stuff you're getting and patients, agents know when to run or not because they're just looking at are they going to get more in the first period than they're going to get in the second period. So the central bank can avoid this now. They send, so let me let me spend the two minutes here. The central bank can avoid this run by liquidating less than this red line. So if they're below this red line, then they can make sure that x1 of n is below x2 of n, no matter what the n is. So this is a you know um, you know dominant strategy, run avoidance if you like, and uh, it's run proof. Right, so only y n equals y star will happen. Now you get the efficient solution. Great. That's in particular true if you only liquidate, you know, constant amount. Now you could say, well, problem solved. Why don't we do this? Well, the problem of the price implications. So if you look at the price implication for the brown line or maybe the red line, they're here in these two slides. So the brown line would imply that the price as a function of n you know, would, would go up dramatically, would no longer hit maybe a price target of one if that's what you want. And even with the, with the red policy function, you would, you would not hit it. And so that raises credibility issues, different from the one in Kudlow and Prescott, but, you know, similar in spirit, where, you know, if the central bank says, well, you know, there are all these patient agents coming and spending, we're just going to let the economy inflate, you know, and then, then they start spending. And then somebody says, well, wait a second, your Maastricht Treaty, you know, central bank mandate, you can't do that. And, and so it may not be a credible threat to, to let that happen. Okay, so 
So then we say, well, what if the central bank says we have to be fully priced there? We want to maintain, we, we are sort of hard nosed Bundesbank style here. You're going to keep the same price level no matter what the N is. And if you do the calculations, you see that you have to have a linear liquidation function because the price, the price is just going to be N times M divided Y over N. And so you want to keep the price stable. That means Y of N is just, just be a linear function of N, and that's it. But if you have, if you're particularly hard nosed about price stability, you know it's 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 run proof, so that's great. But you can no longer hit the you know efficient uh, liquidation efficient uh, outcome here at lambda, so you're losing efficiency. Conversely, if you're a bit more Italian and say you know what we're gonna we're gonna try to keep price stable as long as we can, but you know if you liquidate everything, I mean that's it, right? I mean what can we do? And let prices rip up there. Well, then at least for this earlier portion, you know, prices are going, the liquidation is going to be linear in, in, in N. You can then hit the efficient allocation. That's great. But now you're breaking through this red line and it's no longer run proof. And the paper we then go, you know, there's a huge mechanism design literature and Jacqueline and early resolution and, and suspension of. Uh, convertibility and so forth. Happy to talk about it. I have a whole slide on that that goes into some of that. And you could talk about whether it resolves it or not. I mean, the short answer is no, but I mean, you can challenge me on this. So let me just, let me just conclude. You know, I just wanted to raise these points. The currency landscape has changed dramatically. And you know, Bitcoin has shown that privately issued currencies are possible. It's an attractive currency, but now, now we have all this interaction with CBDC, with pricing, you know, with criminal activity that we just have to think about. But at the end of the day, I think these change monitor policy, financial stability and regulation are really interesting. This crowd here, you know, is particularly capable of addressing this. So, so go ahead and think about this. Think about CBDC, think about privacy, think about, um, think about the crypto market. I mean, it's just, I think it's super fascinating. And I think, uh, I mean, personal take on this is, you know, do not be afraid, this will all improve our lives. So thank you very much, and sorry for going over time, maybe due to my internet breakdown here. Thank you, Harat, for the great talk. And uh, now we collect questions from the floor. If there is any question for Harat. Yeah, Harald, I have one. Um, what, what is exactly the problem that this CBDC is coming to solve? It seems kind of, uh, we're trying to imitate a digital incarnation to make payments easier among people who are not physically together. You're trying to fix market power in banking. What, what is it? Because some of your prescriptions might depend on that. That's actually a great question. And, and to be honest, I think the central bankers are totally confused on that themselves, right? They give you different answers depending on the day when you ask. I think it all, they see this threat from the cryptocurrency world and particular Libra. I think there's a statement by the, by the chief of the, by, by the head of the Swedish central bank who said, okay, now we need to act, right? And, you know, they're afraid that basically these private guys come along and take away the monopoly. I mean, think about it, right? So that's a threat. But it's unclear, you know, what's the what's the use case for central bank digital currency, right? I mean, um, Duffy makes the argument that it can put fire under the behinds of commercial banks to not, you know, to not just, you know, ha have all these profits that that we all thought maybe competition will ease away. You know, I don't know. Is that a good argument? Um, it could be for financial inclusion, right? That more people can make payments. Um, for myself, I also think, you know, something that many of these digital currencies offer is these options on the blockchain. It's programmable. You can put contracts on there. There are smart contracts to centralize finance. I mean, you know, ADA or Ethereum are, are too incomplete. You can, you, can put your, you can put your favorite, you know, dynamic programming, MATLAB program on there, right? You have to translate in the programming language. And, and solve it on the Ethereum blockchain. You have to pay Ethereum for that to happen. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise doing that. But imagine, I mean, it's the computation you can do there and the kinds of contracts you can do there is enormous. And people have moved into that world by having these non-fungible tokens, a piece of art are traded and so forth. Is this something that a central bank digital currency should also offer? Maybe, because otherwise the more shiny thing will be the private stuff. But these are great, great questions. And I think this crowd, you know, 
can give guidance to central banks. Listen, you know, this is what you're solving with this. This is not what you're solving with this. This is how we think about this. I think um, I think central bank desperately need guidance on on what they want to accomplish with that. They're just plowing ahead, you know, for different reasons. And it's a great, great question. Thanks. I have a question. Uh, oh, so this fundamental equation from Wallace, et cetera, it seems to me that there is a bit of data one could use. Could one somehow tease out sort of how likely it is that uh, the Bitcoin price movements are following that fundamental equation? Yeah, thanks, Peter. So um, one could, but but I can give you sort of a, a bird's eye view on this. So when we wrote this paper in 2009, in 2009 and we wrote it actually in 2008, I argued, look, you can't look at the Bitcoin price evolution until then because we only got interest in Bitcoin because it rose so much. So there's an anthropic problem here, right? If that never risen, we wouldn't have written the paper. But then I pointed to the Bitcoin price evolution from 2000, you know, March 2008 onwards to the middle of 2009 and so forth. So I said, look, this looks like a martingale, right? The problem is that since then, the Bitcoin price has gone up from about $8,000 to $50,000. And if you think, if you just take a two-period model, you know, where you have a martingale and you go up from $88,000 to $50,000 and, and, you know, times factor six, you would have to say, well, you know, there's an 18% probability that that happens. And with 80% probability, Bitcoin should have been wiped out, right? And, and yeah. so I think that's the challenge that we, has, that we keep on seeing over the last few years, you know, Bitcoin rising dramatically in price and, and hasn't, having risen dramatically in price. And for that to be considered with the martingale, you'd have to say, well, for some reason, all these events that led to wipeout of Bitcoin didn't happen. And it, but that becomes increasingly unlikely, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes increasingly unlikely that that's the story. And so, so I think, um, I don't know, I'm a little torn here. I'd like to defend my Martingale result, but I think maybe something else is going on. I don't think well, it's really by the way. But. I have a comment on the Martingale result. It's, it's basically a no arbitrage condition, right? Yeah, you can. Well, uh, no, all, well if, just say yes. I let me continue. <laughs> Go ahead. That that's a Walrasian result. If you put a little bit of search, a little bit of bargaining, a little bit of recognizability and acceptability, and maybe haircuts on collateral that we do in our non Walrasian models, that Martingale thing doesn't hold. There has to be an adjustment for the liquidity of each asset. So, you know, those of us who are using non Walrasian models, we don't think that Martingale condition is the last word. Yeah, it's, it's a fair point, except we all have, have already leveraged that argument to say, how come that dollar doesn't have the rate of return that, say, bonds have? How come, the, you know, the interest rate dominance argument can be explained by the frictions that you mentioned? I'm totally sympathetic with that argument. But the comparison that we do is to dollars themselves. So, so in order to get Bitcoin to appreciate that much more relative to the dollar and to appreciate more than what we have seen happening for bonds, I think that's going to be a real challenge, right? Well, You'd okay. almost have to so, have the so, negative of a liquidity premium or something on no, Bitcoin. I mean, maybe it's Bitcoin, there. It's a, so, so dollars have an advantage. They're accepted by almost everybody and Bitcoin is not. On the other hand, Bitcoin has an advantage. It's easier to use for electronic payments than dollars. So depending on how these two characteristics, you know, weigh out, that's going to tilt that Martingale equation in d different ways. Yeah, I, 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 it, I look. I, I think these are great questions. In fact, in my AA papers and proceedings paper with Linda, we looked at a case where there are different goods and. Some there's an advantage to pay for dollars, others with Bitcoin, the transaction costs. I mean, that's how we did it there. But you could uh, you call that a cheap version of Marcus, right, if you like. But, but, I, but, but I just want to throw the challenge out there, right? If you think there, sure. if, if there's a world in which Bitcoin rises faster than, you know, real assets and, and dollars has, rises lower, you know, how do, how do we get that? And, you know, what, what's happening there? I think it's... it's it, it deserves an explanation. That's that's all I'm saying. I, I mean, maybe sure. it's easy, and may, maybe you're going to write that paper. I'm just, you know, this this is po the point here is to throw out that question rather than giving you the answer. So, thanks. Sure. I got to go to a different conference starting now.
Great talk, Harold. Everybody, you, great day today. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Bye, everybody. Go. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think if there is no further question, this would be the official end of the today's uh, conference. And uh, we are going to reconvene tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. Eastern time. And I see there was a question by Luca, so I'll try to find the email and then send to that one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks thank so you much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Ciao.